Hello Automators, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and today I'm going to help you get the new Nest Hub second generation fully set up. We're gonna walk through all of the big features you want as well as do a full walkthrough of these little nuanced settings that you're going to need. So let's get started with the basic setup and get you rolling. Before we go too far into the video, please note that there are tons of time codes down below so you can search through and use this video as a resource over and over again. So make sure you save this, share it with your friends and family who maybe need the different aspects and you can click on those time codes to jump around the video. In all cases, you're going to need the Google Home application. Now this is available on Android or iOS and you will need an account to get logged into. And this is a Google account, you will absolutely need one. Go ahead and sign up for one. Now, one thing before we get started, if you're using a student account or a business account from a company that you got, sometimes there's restrictions on those accounts and this may cause you issues in the future. So just maybe create a new account that you wanna use for everything in your life and I'll show you how to get some of those other accounts integrated. Now, here's how the device starts up when you first plug it in. Hi, to get started, download the Google Home app on a phone or tablet. In lots of cases, when you get into the Google Home application, you'll actually see a little set up Nest Hub. But if you don't, there is a plus button up at the top left that will allow you to start the setup of a device process. We get you to the same point that pressing this little set up Nest Hub button will get you to. Now, the reason that shows up for me is because I have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi turned on on my phone and you need to make sure that you've done that on the phone or the tablet that you're using. Now, I have to choose a home. If you don't have one, you'll have to add one here. You can see, or well, you can't see, but my address is input into here. This helps with location and other things. So you decide what you wanna give there. Now it's saying that it's found the Nest Hub. This is a great sign and if you're not finding it, then you might need to get a little closer to the device or again, that Bluetooth or Wi-Fi needs to be turned on. So I've found it, I'm going to hit yes. Now they want me to scan the QR code and I'm gonna try and do this in reverse here. This is gonna be, oh, I managed to do that. I'm pretty impressed with myself right now. So what it's doing now is making a connection between your phone and the Nest Hub itself. Again, another thing that might help you within your Bluetooth is if you're connected to other devices at the time, you could disconnect those just for the time being. That might help you get an initial connection here. Okay, now it took about a minute and then it finally said connected. Now the next question they're giving you is whether you wanna help improve the Nest Hub. And I usually say no to this because it's sharing additional statistics. Now, I also got a notice that this was manufactured in a different country. That's because it came from the US and I'm in Canada. If you get that kind of a thing, you gotta pay attention to if your Wi-Fi network is actually compatible with this, which works on 2.4 or five gigahertz Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi networks. Of course, there are versions that are made for different countries, so maybe just get the one that's available in your country. Now, the next thing I need to do is choose where the device is going to be in my home. Don't worry, you can change this later. And there's a custom room decision or a custom room option at the bottom of this. Now, because this is a Nest Hub with a feature called sleep sensing, this is going to end up in my bedroom next to my bed. The next step is to connect to Wi-Fi. Now, you can choose any of the networks that you have access to. I have a guest network and a regular network. I'm going to choose that. And you would have to put in your Wi-Fi password, so you'll need that before you start this process. If you're having trouble with the Wi-Fi setup portion of this, then it's likely your Wi-Fi system is a little overloaded. So really pay attention here. It might seem like you've got great coverage because the Wi-Fi signal has all the bars in your smartphone, but a lot of Wi-Fi systems can actually get overloaded and have too many devices on them. And so if you're running into problems in that step right there, you can see mine's already connected. Well, 
then you might have to look at your Wi-Fi system. Now what you can do in the short term is just turn a bunch of those devices off, see if you can make the connection. The other tip I'll give you is to bring that a little bit closer to your Wi-Fi router and keep your phone kind of close by as well. And that just makes it all go a little bit seamless. You can also have interference sources. So don't have too many devices close by uh, that broadcast Wi-Fi signals or that can interfere with Wi-Fi. So the next thing is kind of a privacy component of the Google Assistant. So you're getting a lot of information for how they're using different pieces of information and how they're attaching different services like YouTube. Now the next question I got is probably a little bit unique to me, but it brings up a great component here. The request is to change my assistant language to English Canadian, but I'm going to leave it in English US and whenever you can, English US ends up with the most features. So generally I would leave it on English US. We'll talk about more of this and, and how the features are impacted by your choices in the future. But if you get that option, choose English US. It's obviously gonna be a little bit different sounding if you're from somewhere like Australia or somewhere. The next component is voice match. Now voice match allows you to get personalized results. So I'm going to hit next and we've got to agree to a basic statement here about what they're doing with your voice, what they're doing with the recordings that are happening there. So there is some review that goes on at companies that create these voice assistants and you do actually have to agree to that component. Now, it's saying that it already recognizes my voice and all you would have to do here is follow the on-screen on instructions which tell you to say the wake word a few times and then they create a voice model for you that this device will then know and the next screen is getting those personal results. Now, this is things like your calendars and recommendations from services like music and YouTube and different components that are more personalized to you. And you know what, you're going to find a lot of worth in getting personal results. So I would do the voice match process and I would agree to the personal results. This is something specific to the second generation Nest Hub. This is called Quick Gestures. Now, you can basically do an, a start stop on music and then you also have a snooze. And that's, that's a good little wave at the device when the alarm is going off on your bedside table. So those are the two gestures we have today more could be added I'm going to agree to that and again Google's letting you know what we're doing with data how this system works this is all based on a technology they have on the device called Soli, and that's a radar technology that operates at about 60 uh, gigahertz actually and can measure different things happening so you'll find those quick gestures pretty responsive the next component is one of the most important components. It's your music service. Now, you can actually attach multiple music sources or services and the free versions are available. Now, you can see that I have a YouTube Music Premium service. Now, that means I have previously signed up with YouTube Music and signed up for a monthly price. I think it's $10 Canadian uh, here in Canada and the price varies. If you have family members, you wanna have six different people with their own kind of profiles, well, you'll need to upgrade and that's a little more expensive. I'm not even gonna get into the numbers. Spotify has a free service as well and YouTube Music both have those free services. Now, what happens with those is they end up being ad supported in some cases and you don't get to choose everything that plays. So it becomes a little more restrictive, but you can use those. Now, when you tap on a service, it becomes the default music service. And if you haven't already signed into an account, you will have to do that here. The next component are radio services. Now, I'll call this a premium radio service. It's not the basic radio service because that's already available in many countries and I'll show you how to use that in a little bit. But if you have Sirius XM here in North America, you can hit that little plus, connect your account, and it's the same as those other music services. 
I've already linked my Netflix account, but I'm going to show you that it is quite easy to link your other accounts. You might have different services here, depending on the country you're in. Some of these are going to be available. Some of them are not. So you can see that I'm heading over to Disney Plus. I'm linking this profile and you have to choose a profile to link to that. Let's get started with video and audio calls. With the Google Nest Hub, you don't have a camera, but it's a little bit interesting. Sometimes your friends and family will be able to turn on their cameras. You'll be able to see them on the display. The other thing is you'll be able to make audio calls through Google Duo to other contacts who have Duo, and you can make basic phone calls in many countries. So you've got to check if your country can do that. That service changes a little bit over time, which countries have that available. So I'm just going to hit continue. And if you already have a Duo account, it's going to pop up with your account and you can simply kind of tap on that. You're entering in your number and it's already connected to my Duo account because I already have one and I've logged into it on this phone. So it's easiest to have the Duo application before you start that part of the process and then the the login and make sure you're using the same email account and then just put in your phone number and it all connects very seamlessly if you can't do this in this part of the process again I'm gonna show you how to get everything connected later when we talk fully about video calls and audio calls on this device this is one of the best components of having a Google Nest smart display and we have three options for what we can put on the screen and again you can change this in the future now Google Photos is attached to your account that you're using that you started the Google Home application with and that is what you're going to have to use for this at the time being anyways you also have the art gallery that you can go into and this will allow you to pick from kind of curated photos that Google does plus there are a number of full screen clocks now I'm gonna give you a quick insight into the art gallery you can see that there's a number of different segments and you can tap to turn off any of those segments if that's maybe a kind you don't want now I'm gonna head back here and I'm gonna show you the full screen clocks these are interesting and new ones are added on a semi-regular basis but you can choose any of these to be your basis and for now I'm going to choose the timeless light now the weather one puts that weather right front and center and in the future when I go through this uh, feature entirely I'm going to show you a little bit uh, a little bit more that you can do there's actually a fun little thing you can do now if you go into Google Photos they load in all your albums and then you can choose from those different albums so it's quite easy to add a few albums hit next and that is what will show up on here so for now, I'm going to choose that full screen clock and I'm going to go down to timeless light and we're going to leave that on the display. It just works a little better with the camera and things like that. Sleep sensing is a really complicated thing to explain, but it's using that solely radar technology. It's going to sit next to your bedside and I'm going to walk through the full setup process kind of separate from this. There are some important aspects about setup of sleep sensing. It's got to be about level with your mattress. It shouldn't be too high or too low. It also has to be about one to two feet away from your mattress, so not too far out. And then you have to angle it towards your chest is best, actually. Make sure nothing blocks the display from seeing you. You can put little things kind of under, like your smartphone, but nothing too big. And then they're going to ask you to lay there. Calibration should take less than a minute. Just relax, stay still and breathe normally. And that's starting now. The device will then calibrate and if it says it failed, you might need to reposition things and try again. Otherwise it should can't come back and say that it's ready. One thing to understand about sleep sensing is it requires the Google Fit application and you will be passing data into that Google Fit application. Now, you probably wanna read a little bit about that as you go, but that's how they're aggregating the information. A lot of the initial data, things like how much you're coughing or snoring or when all of those events are happening are kept on the device. Now. 
parts of that information will go to Google Fit and therefore are sitting in the cloud, but most of the processing is done on device, so your detailed data doesn't leave the device. The good news about tracking these items like coughing and snoring is that you can actually turn off those components separately from the, uh, the sleep tracking feature, so you don't have to track everything here. Now you can see they're asking me about Google Fit and I'm going to go ahead and get those personalized sleep recommendations or suggestions. That's one of the biggest components here for sleep sensing. It's going to give you recommendations and suggestions over time and I think that's almost the most important aspect of what this device does because lots of Sleep trackers will tell you you're sleeping terribly, but they won't necessarily give you anything to do with that. So it asked me to download and install Google Fit. I've already done that. You should do that. Connect it to that same account. When you go through that process, just use that same account. Now we're gonna set up a sleep schedule here and I'm just, I'm just gonna put in what I think. You can change any of these times, it's very simple. And once you've done that, you're just gonna hit the next button. That sleep schedule can be adjusted, so don't worry too much about that. Now, the device is almost finished. We're almost done here on the basic setup, and I can just hit continue, and they're gonna give me a little walkthrough on some of the controls. The first thing to understand about this device is there's an ambient EQ light sensor. So it's looking at the light around and actually the color of the light, and it will adjust the display. Now, you can adjust these settings. I'm gonna show you how to do that in a minute, but this really helps to dim the display when the room is kinda of darker, and it helps to color match a little bit with your lighting, which is very impressive and very helpful for eye strain. The volume buttons are on the back of the device. There's an up and a down, and actually if you hold those two, that is how you get a factory reset. There's a link down below to see just how that goes though. Now, the mic switch on the back, this allows you to mute the microphone. So in some cases, you will find that the this device and maybe another device are hearing you and so they might both be responding or the wrong one might be responding the mute microphone switch is obviously going to help with that now we're going to get a little bit of a demo from google here on what the display can do by adopting better sleep habits we can make each night's sleep more restful and refreshing to improve our overall wellness and feel our best every day all right, we've got all the basics set up here. It ran through a couple of videos to tell us some things about the product and then a quick demo. Those are great things and I encourage you to do them, but it's important to understand some of the hardware on this device before we go too far. Now, there are three far field microphones and they're going to hear you fairly well when the music is even being played at full volume and you're just kind of speaking towards the device from about 10 to 15 feet. You might have to raise your voice after that, or if you have other speakers playing in a group, well, it could maybe struggle a little bit to hear you, but there are three of those microphones. There's also those volume controls we talked about on the back and the mute microphone switch as well. The speaker itself is improved over the first generation Nest Hub and you'll find it kind of moderately well balanced. I wouldn't say it's something that performs super well, but it's definitely serviceable, especially in that bedroom scenario in the mornings. You don't necessarily want to be blown away by a speaker.
hidden hardware components on here. We've already talked about Soli a little bit in terms of those gestures and in terms of sleep sensing. That technology will probably continue to be developed on this device. The ambient EQ light sensor is very important for adjusting the screen and I think you just leave that one and I'll show you some of the little detailed changes that you can make for that. There's also an ultrasonic sensor and this means that controls will show up when you're playing music and you just kind of walk up to the device. It'll also wake up in a lot of cases just for you when you walk towards the device and you'll find that even timers switch the interface as you get closer here. So there's a lot of sensing in terms of where you are in the home or in relation to the Nest Hub. The first thing to understand from a software perspective is that there is a voice assistant on here. That's called the Google Assistant. We've already set up a lot of components of that in that initial setup. Now, what I'll tell you about that and in combination with the AI processor that is available on this device is that you will find the things you do on a regular basis become quicker and quicker and the device can respond faster to you. Otherwise, in a lot of cases, that Google Assistant will have to go out to the internet. It will use your Wi-Fi and your network connection in order to get out to the cloud and then pull that information. So that happens, but the AI component of this, for example, when I ask for timers on this device already, because I've been using it for a while, it is very quick. It'll almost respond before I have got the whole statement out to start a timer. One of the really nice aspects of this device is that you can pull down here and it will bring up your home, your home control uh, screen very quickly. Now, that screen will obviously develop as you add more devices to it, but that's a quick pull down that was actually missing for a while from the interface. Another thing that you can do is actually pull up from the bottom and this will give you a whole new interface that we're just going to walk through now. So let's start by swiping up from the bottom and we have a number of controls. Now the very first one is your automatic brightness or your ambient EQ that we talked about a bit earlier. What you can do is set this higher and lower if you'd like in terms of brightness and then that will keep it stagnant here. It won't change. But if I take it back to ambient EQ, you're going to see that it self adjusts. Now, if I put my finger over that sensor, you can see how dark the screen gets very quickly. This is volume control, and we have a couple of volume controls. So when you tap that little arrow there, you're seeing the alarm and timer volume. So you can adjust that distinctly or separately from the main volume adjustment. Now, if we're just simply using the volume buttons on the back, obviously we're adjusting that based base volume there. Our next control is the do not disturb mode here. You can just toggle that on and off and then the device is gonna be pretty quiet. Here is the alarm management panel and we'll go through this in a little bit, but this is a quick way of getting back to that alarm management panel. The next segment here is actually about giving feedback. So if you're ever on a page and you have a, a bit of struggle or you wanna just send Google some feedback, that is what you can hit and then this is what happens. No problem, tell me what needs to be improved. Nothing. The last component is the most complex and you can go ahead and look at device information including the Wi-Fi network that you're connected to. Now you can't actually change that and you can't change the device name but you can see some technical information about your device including the IP address and the versions of firmware and software on the device here. Plus you have that ability to send feedback and you have some labels and, and open source licenses in there. But more importantly is your display theme here. And this allows you to adjust between light, dark, and an automatic mode. So I just leave it on the automatic mode. If it's late in the evening, it's going to adjust to dark mode and it's going to adjust to light in the in the daytime when we have lots of light around. 
The next segment is the photo frame. And most of the time when you tap on this, it's gonna tell you that it needs to know who's sitting here. But because I've been talking to the display and working with it, it will probably open this up. But what you're going to do here in the photo frame is a full uh, management go. of the entire panel and what's on there. So if you wanna to adjust to those Google Photos, the art gallery or that full screen clock that we showed in the basic setup, you can do that. But you can also adjust some of these other settings. So banner notifications are the ones that kinda of show up up in the top corner here and they talk about calendar events, different reminders, things like that. The weather, showing that weather for your area, whether you wanna show or hide that, that can be allowed on the clock you're using or the, the interface you're using, the pictures, that's likely to be there, but in some cases it will still not show up. So right now you can see I have this clock on it and that does not allow the weather to be shown on the main page. If I'd like, I can show the time or hide it. And again, that's gonna be mostly with the photos that you're putting on there. And do you wanna show the personal photo data? So who took the photo, the location, things like that can show up. I usually hide that, it's just kind of distracting. Portrait Google Photos, this allows you to show two portrait photos on the screen at the same time if you put it in show pairs and otherwise it will, if you just leave it in show, it will show one and then it'll kind of be across the middle here. So I like to use the show pairs. It gives me two pictures at the same time. Photo curation, I like to use the live albums only and that is a longer discussion that we'll talk about in the whole photo frame section of this video today. The slideshow speed, that's allowing you to adjust how fast the pictures are actually changing. Now you also have settings for motion sense, sleep sensing, and gesture. So you can see I have my sleep sensing off right here. You could restart that whole process. Do you want motion sense, which are those gestures, and you need this on to use sleep sensing? You can also go and learn a little more there. For sleep sensing, when you go in there, it would be turned on, but you have to calibrate first. So this is a way to come back and recalibrate your device if you ever need that for sleep sensing. The other thing you might need is quick gestures. So do you want those gestures turned on? So all of this, all of three of these sections is basically working in conjunction with quick gestures and motion sensors or motion sensing to be on. So those quick gestures are the start and the stop. And do you want that play and pause media available? You can try it out in there. And do you want to be able to snooze with a swipe of your hand in the morning? One other thing you might want to do is kind of swipe there towards the right from the left hand side. This brings you back to your home screen. It will bring you back to that photo display if you'd like that running all the time. Now let me run you through the basics of what you will find in this interface. It's very powerful and it does get better over time. You get recommendations that change and they get better for you as a person, especially if you've used that voice match component and you're the last person to use this. All right, let's do the quick walkthrough here. Now, one thing to note right off the bat is you can pull to the left and then you get the clock here or the, the basic clock. And this is what you'll see show up in dim lighting in most cases, but you can do one more pull to the left and it will actually turn off the whole screen. Now I can tap and I can tap again and I'm coming back to here and tap is again forward into the your evening section. Now, this will say your evening, your afternoon, your morning, whatever time of day it is, and everything on here will be a little bit customized to how you use the display. Now, each of these cards can be held a long hold on in order to give you a little menu here to open or dismiss the card if you don't wanna see that one anymore. And of course, you can tap on any of these to execute what it is you wanna have execute so there goes my bedroom lights on or off as I tap on that button there and I can tap in here in order to start adjusting the lights now essentially you can control the brightness the colors 
and then if you want to individually control the lights you can go into each one and as you tap into each one you can adjust each one individually again by the light uh, by the color or the brightness now as I pull to the left you can see I go back a screen and the same thing happens again when I pull sorry to the right from the left hand side now, as I scroll to the right, here's the do it again menu, and I really love this one. You could dismiss it if you're not finding it useful, but it has those basic things that you keep asking the voice assistant to do for you. And again, I scroll one more over, and I know this is blurred, but this is the household contacts. And again, you see that little arrow right here that is allowing you to go deeper because there's more than four people on my list of household contacts. So if someone needs to get to it, they can kind of tap there. All of these are call icons and you can see the difference between a duo audio call and a duo video call. Now, each section you can tap on up here in order to jump between the two, and you can actually pull left and right in order to move through the menu. So the next section is wellness. This is where you're gonna get all of the sleep information, and this will continue to be developed over time as Google adds in more things. The home control section is obviously a massive section to go through. We're not gonna go through everything, but understand it that you can go into each individual section here and control different aspects of your home and again if you want to go deeper you can tap in to each segment and continue to go in again and again you can see that light isn't even available right now now cameras you could go in and live view your cameras if you'd like to do that this allows you to see the whole list of them and then you can tap on them of course when you see the names you can request the google assistant to show any of those cameras climate our thermostats and then connectivity this is because i have nest wi-fi so it will bring up my latest speed test i could run a new one and if i want to get my guest wi-fi set up this actually brings up a qr code for my guest network they can just use their phone to scan in order to get on the guest network the routine section this allows you to execute all of your different routines in your home and i have quite a few so when you do that what you might end up is very similar to me you can see over here on the right you'll find this kind of a navigation available quite often if you have a lot of devices or a lot of items in a list so you're able to adjust by letter very quickly this lets you move through the menus quickly so if you tap on any of those routines they totally run and you can go into each individual room here your list of rooms and this gives you your full look through your whole smart home. Speakers and TV becomes very useful when you are casting something and you just want to stop a different group or a different device from continuing that cast. You can also just start music, hitting that play music. There's no tap into each of these individual ones. So that's all you're getting here is the ability to play music. And when they're playing, you can get into them and then stop them. And again, we have the control for our lighting. So that's a quick on off. And we have other quick controls that we have used regularly in this section of the display. Over to media, all of these recommendations will get better and better and better as you use the device more and it knows you better and better. So YouTube, YouTube music, and then we have actually a game section. Now I haven't done a ton of those here, but you've seen a few on the channel. The top stories for you section and you will see podcasts and other types of media show up here as you use those different aspects on the display. But top stories for you, this gets trended towards your likes or your interests and I'll show you that later in the video how you actually can customize this a little bit. Moving into communication, we have those household contacts again. And then we also have the ability to broadcast and you can see broadcast to another room. So you can specifically do those things just by tapping on screen here. You can also make video calls. Now, obviously with no camera here, that's a little bit different, but you're opening up the video for the other side uh, to make a call there. 
Obviously, you can make general phone calls, just numbers. You can't make calls to emergency numbers, and you can call other Google Home devices. The family section allows you to work with things like the family bell routine. So you can see that it's bringing up that this bell is gonna go off and my kid's gotta brush his teeth in 47 minutes here. There's also the ability to leave things like family notes and of course you can do things like set homework timers. Now location tracking or location sharing, this allows you, this is a, a setup function and I believe this is related to Life360 and only available actually in the US at the moment. But you could start the setup process there for that. It's probably a little bit easier in the application. There's just some fun little things here for the family. And then when we head over to Discover, these are things that maybe you haven't done with the display to date or just general interest things that maybe you or a kid might really enjoy. Now, up at the top, you're noticing this little uh, bed here. This is the Sleep Sensing Active actually showing up. And if I wanted to, I could go in and learn more about Sleep Sensing. Before we get in depth into the app and into all those features that you're after, I'm going to give you just a quick rundown of the device settings. Now, what you should see at the top is that home button. If you're not in the right home, you can actually tap on the one at the very top and this will allow you to switch between homes in case you happen to have set up multiple. Don't worry about that other home one. We'll talk about that more. And I'm just gonna skip by a lot of this interface and go down to the room that we had put this Nest Hub in. Now I'm going to tap on that display and what's really exciting for me is I no longer have to re screen record here and you don't have to have it here. I can actually hit this cast my screen over to the Nest Hub right here. So from this point forward, I should be able to show you the actual settings and everything on the device right here on my screen. I'm actually really excited about that. I hope you are too. But this is a really great screen mirroring capability. So you can see that as I do these things, the screen is being mirrored right there. Now, you're probably initially thinking, oh great, I can mirror any video content. That won't necessarily work. There's still restrictions that those app makers put into the app. So you've got what you've got, try it on whatever application you'd like, but screen mirroring is now fully available on the Nest Hub. So now that we have the interface up here, obviously you're gonna mostly be looking at this in portrait mode. I might switch like this oftentimes as we go through the video, but the first thing you're going to notice is the ability to adjust the volume, and you can see that it adjusted on the device. Now there's actually that second component that you can adjust in terms of volume on the device, but this is just the basic now playing volume that you're going to get out of it. You also have that stop mirroring capability down at the bottom of this device, and it will always say cast my screen if you're not doing that. And we have an equalizer here. So if you'd like to adjust a little bit how the device sounds, you do have some capability here to do that. I would say you just kind of leave it in the middle and in general, you're going to find the display all right to listen to. The next button is top right. It is the full settings for this device. Now, we have a ton of different settings that we're gonna walk through here. And as we do that, I'll talk a little bit about how some of these things work, but I won't necessarily go in depth on everything. Do that more in the full features setup. Now, we can adjust the device name at any point if we'd like to. So if you wanna change that name, you wanna to refer to it something different, go right ahead. You can also adjust the home that it is in, as well as the room that it's in. So we have the placement, if you wanna pick a different room, go ahead and you hit that save button over on the right. Now, if you ever forget the Wi-Fi here, you can see the little forget button over there. If you do that, basically you've got a factory reset and reset up the device. So you, if you ever change your Wi-Fi credentials, you're going to have to hit forget if you even can anymore, you likely can can't and what happens is you end up factory resetting so that little forget button I don't find it real useful time format you can switch between 12 and 24 now the preview program is something that I find very interesting personally now 
Next up is the preview program and I find this aspect of the device very interesting. So when you go into that, you can join the preview program and you can allow email notifications as well to your email about this program. Now I always do that and the reason I do that is because I happen to enjoy getting the new features even if they're a little bit buggy. So that's what happens here is you basically once you've enjoyed once you've joined the preview program you're going to get some of those new features a little bit before everyone else there is also some data on licensing if you are into that sort of thing i'm not and then you do have some technical information so you might at some point be asked what the cast firmware or the system firmware is if you're getting support from google on this you might be asked for that information. You can also see the IP address if you're someone who kind of manages what devices are on your network like I do. Well, back to the bedroom display settings here. I'm going to go into recognition and sharing. Now, the linked account, that is something that you'll see grow as you add family members, which we'll talk about later. But the recognition and personalization components of this display, well, We've already set that up in the initial setup, and if you didn't accept personal results and do the voice match, you're going to see something a little bit different here. You probably want to turn on that allowing of personal results, the photos, the email, the calendar, contacts, all of those different things, all of that functionality goes away if you don't have personal results turned on. Now, how personal results appear. This is a little bit different on this new Nest Hub. See, what's happening today is most of your information isn't really that personal to you. You might have a calendar entry for an appointment, but now with the sleep sensing, your data will actually show up physically on the display Anyone could look at it. There's no camera on this, so it doesn't know uh, through the face match feature that the Google Nest Hub Max has. It doesn't know who's looking at the display. It only knows who's asked. So if you say proactively show it, some of that data will show up on screen and anyone could look at that. You've got to decide if you want that to happen. Down below is voice match. So if you haven't done this, you can go ahead and adjust voice match. We've got a couple of different components here and you can see that the first section is about this phone right here. So you may or may not have that, but if you have the Google Assistant on your phone and it can listen for the wake word, mostly Androids, then you have this radio button to turn on. It can then listen for the wake word and then you have the ability to retrain the voice model. So you could delete your voice model if you don't want that to be on device anymore and you can hit that retrain and it will go through that whole process. I'm not going to do that right now. Down below is the shared devices. Now these are all your speakers. This is everything that is using the voice match that you already put in at the start of the process. So if you ever want to, you can remove devices and you can add devices here. So for example, the living room TV, you can see that I can add that. Now that's a Google Chromecast. So as I've added that, they're activating voice match on that device and I have to agree to the same thing I did in the initial setup. So you just saw me add a device, but down at the bottom is the remove from eligible devices. So I can hit the X on any of these to remove them from my personal voice match. This is my account. If you have someone else, you have to go into their account and remove their voice models separately. Now at the bottom, I can remove from eligible devices and get the option to remove from all of them. I can also do that voice retraining on the Nest Hub right here. So it's important to note that this is the voice model for the shared devices and this is the voice model for my phone in this case. So you gotta read those headings there. You can also start the invite process for bringing in other home members into your home. All the way back to the recognition and sharing screen. So this, I mean, we just talked about voice matching and all of those things for a while, but ultrasound sensing, we talked about that earlier as a hardware component on here. You can turn that feature off if you don't want it to know when you're kinda walking up to the device. 
do you want others to control your cast media? So what happens is when somebody is in range and connected to your Wi-Fi, they can sometimes start casting from their device. This allows friends to play music or play videos from their phone. If their phone is capable of that, that's great. And if you want to send those crash reports, go ahead, turn on that radio button right there. Now, the next thing is notifications and digital well-being. Now, this allows you to get a little more personalized with this device or a little more structure around what you like. So, just because the filters and downtime is a little bit different, I'm going to switch my phone up here. Now, digital well-being allows you to filter certain things out uh, at, at certain times. Both of these things allow you to kind of create a calendar for the device and to filter out certain things that you maybe don't want. So, do you want to filter out for everyone in your home and, and or do you want to filter for supervised accounts and guests? Now, guests are anyone who is not voice matched to the display and supervised accounts are kids. The other supervised accounts can be other adults that you've managed through Family Link, and again, we're gonna to get to that later here, but you just gotta make this decision initially whether you wanna kinda of filter the content for everyone or just those people that don't have a voice match. Now, which devices do you wanna put it on? You can see that you can actually put this on all devices if you'd like, or you can find your new Nest Hub and only turn it on for that device. So I can hit next and I get to pick now within videos. So do I want only YouTube kids content to play? There, that's kind of how I do that selection. If I don't want videos to play at all, I can select that. Or do I want to just allow anything? I can go ahead and do that. Now, I think that the restricted mode and the filtered content, that is probably good enough for a lot of households, but you can get some content on there that you may not love for your children. So you'll have to make that decision there. The next component is, of course, music. Obviously, you can allow non-explicit music, any music, Music or just stop music from playing on this. So you've got to make the decision per service. So you could kind of sneaky hide away something on your kids, say on Spotify only. This next component is just about the Google Assistant really. Now the first thing is allowing or blocking calls to be made or received through this device, but then Assistant answers. Do you actually want to restrict what this device can tell you about a little bit more here? You'll find that pretty heavily restrictive when you switch to restrict answers. I would say leave it, it's pretty much fine. But the one you can look at are the actions. Now, actions are third party developed, they're kind of like apps, and I would say to only allow family friendly actions if you have kids in the household. Now, let's set up downtime, and this is basically when you want to get your kids to stop using the device. So, we're going to set up, and what it does is it blocks all the responses, stops music and video, and alarms and timers do still work. So, if you kind of set those up for the kid, you can still do that. Now, again, we can pick all the devices or we can just pick certain devices. So obviously with a bedroom display, it kind of makes sense. Now, which days you want that to happen on, you could pick the weekends, the weekdays, the school nights, or you can customize fully and turn on and off certain days. So maybe I don't care on the weekends, I'm a bit of a party animal then, I'll go ahead and do that. Now, scheduling downtime, I'm not that early to bed, let's say, I don't know, 10.45 till, yeah, 6 a.m. sounds fine. I don't mind if the speaker comes on at 6 a.m. Now, I've finished that, it is totally down, so when you go to ask it something, it's not gonna do a lot for you during those times. The next one is what I like to use more than I like to use that downtime capability, and that is night mode. Now, night mode, you can again schedule, to whatever you'd like. So I can set it to that same time frame. I can set it to those same days. And what it does is it allows you to automatically set the maximum volume quite low. You can turn on that do not disturb mode so nothing is really gonna happen. If someone's messing with you, trying to broadcast to that device, it's not going to come through. So I like to use this rather than downtime, but 
you can make that decision for yourself. There's also a base do not disturb mode that you can turn on on this device and just leave it in that so you won't get the spoken notifications or reminders or anything like that. The other thing you could do is just YouTube restrict in general. So YouTube restricted mode, hide songs and videos that don't have appropriate content or kids uh, appropriate content and you can f filter YouTube TV. Now that's the specific YouTube TV service. It's not actually all of YouTube. That first one is for YouTube. The next feature is sleep sensing and we can actually adjust how we've dealt with our sleep sensing. So you can always deactivate it. We can deactivate the sound event tracking, which is that coughing and snoring and those personalized sleep suggestions. So you can go into any component here and then you can adjust it. And I think over time what you're gonna find is those settings are kind of in your Google account settings, so it kind of jumps out of the app for a second. You'll find that come into here. Now, here's where we can adjust our bedtime schedule and we can hit the recalibrate option, which you can do on device as well. And here is your assistant access to fit. Now that's Google fit and we're allowing our sleep data, our respiration data to go over uh, to Google fit. And then you can ask about it on this display, how you slept last night. That'll bring up the base display. And then you can also ask how your breathing was and they'll give you a respiration rate for the evening, a, a full average. How was my sleep last night? If you ask how your sleep was, then you'll get a response and normally you'll get this detailed page. Now I'm not going to go into it, but you can tap in for details and because you've connected this to Google Fit, you can see data there. The next component is quick gestures. So we can redo the quick gestures if we want. We could turn that on and off and you can turn off the individual features. So if you're finding that you're around your home and, and you start and stopped media from playing too often, well, go ahead and turn that specific one off. Today, there's only a couple of gestures you can use. It's a start and stop of media like videos or audio. And then you also have the ability to snooze with a wave of your hand. Here is the photo frame. Now you can manage that all on device. I've already shown you that, but we have the ability in the application to adjust here as well. So banner notifications on the photo frame. So what we're talking about here is whether you want the kind of the top ones to the top notifications about your calendar coming up, whether you want those to show up. Do you want the weather to show on screen whenever it can? There's certain frames that won't show that. And do you want the time? Now the next component is personal photo data. I don't usually like to have that on because I'm always showcasing you guys my photos and stuff. So I don't necessarily want my name fully on the screen at all times. Maybe you do, that's up to you. The portrait Google photos aspect. So what they do is they'll stick two photos side by side and they kind of choose which ones to stick side by side. I happen to like it. So I leave it on show pairs. The next component is photo curation. You can choose the live albums feature, which is kind of a specific setting that you choose in uh, Google photos here or you can choose the uh, all albums to be curated by Google. Not a lot of people love the curation, so I tend to kind of put that on live albums and then select other albums. So, you know, a great example of a live album, I believe that recent highlights is a live album. And then the selection of family and friends, when you do that, that becomes a bit of a live album too. So you can just select your other albums and then set this one as live albums only and then it doesn't kind of curate it'll just actually run through all your photos when they curate i find that i have to sometimes tell them to archive a photo or stop showing the photo and you can say that and then they'll ask you a couple of questions and then the photo will go away and it won't show up anymore the slideshow speed of course allows you to adjust how fast it's moving through your pictures change the photo frame here you go 
Once you have this interface open, we're able to change everything we did inside of the application. So we're not going to go through all of these different settings, but it is important to note that you can adjust which photos and which albums are available to you. You can simply tap on any type of art album and you can see that I can get rid of it or I can add it. The same holds true within Google Photos, but what you need to understand there is that this is only for the account you used when you connected to your Google Nest Hub or when you first set up that device. Now you can add and subtract albums as you see fit and then you can hit done and it will shift over. Now there's a new way to deal with all of your photos and when I first shot this you just tapped on the interface to get these three buttons to show up but now you actually hold on the photo that you would like to bring up those three little buttons. Now you can tap that button to stop showing or archive the photo or you can use the command okay. to archive the yes. photo to your Google Assistant and it will request if you'd like to do that. Now you can also hit the favorite button which will bring it up more often in curation and of course you can use that command to favorite this photo. Too. The other thing you can do is share these photos and this becomes really great if you've connected your contacts and you've and also you set some people with. into those household contacts where you can give them nicknames. So for example I could pick my mother to send a photo to and just say, hey, share this photo with mom. You can also go through the list and pick your favorite contact to send your favorite photo to at any Is time. Is that right? Share this photo with mom. Sure, other or home. The next segment is display. Now, this is where you can start to adjust some of the visual components of this. Some of this you can do on screen as well. Choosing a default TV allows you when you say play Netflix or you say play a show on Netflix, which device it's going to play on. You can always say that you'd like to play Netflix on the bedroom display but let's say I always wanted it to start on my Roku because my Roku is in my bedroom as well. I can set that as the default and it will basically start anything I ask. So if I say play Netflix, it'll start on that Roku. Obviously this is going to work better when you're using it in conjunction with say the living room TV which is that Google Chromecast that I have. That's going to work better in general or other smart displays. You'll have to see, you know, for a device like the Roku, not everything works that you request to have happen on that device. But I'm going to set it that way because I can live with what works and what doesn't work there. Visual accessibility, this is for people who have color blindness of certain kinds, they need closed captioning, you can magnify the screen with a triple tap, that's very useful in some cases. So if you need any of those features, that's where they are. Low light activation is the trigger moment that activates what happens during low light. So the first setting here, low light activation, that happens either when it's dark or dim in the room. So do you want it to go into this mode, whether it's really dark or not in your mode now or in your room? Now, the when it gets to that low light setting, what do you want to have happen? Do you want it to just turn off the screen entirely or would you like it to show the clock? I happen to like the clock so I leave that on. Now what's the minimum brightness of the screen? So when you put it into that show clock mode, do you want it to go all the way to dark, dim, bright, or brighter? Do you like things a little bit lighter in the room? Definitely for kids, that's a great option. Now, screen timeout, I like to turn that on after five minutes of inactivity, it will actually turn off the display. I'm not gonna do that during this video, but that is very useful as well. Now, the theme, you can just choose to have it in dark mode all the time or light mode, whatever you'd like, those two modes. You know what, I like to just leave it in auto and then in the evenings it kind of goes to that dark mode. Ambient EQ is really useful and it's really great without an adjustment. I don't find a need to do that, but maybe you want this display to be a little bit darker than the rest of the light in your room. Just kind of move that to the left and it will adjust itself a little bit darker than the room's ambient lighting. Now, again, 
for this video I'm not going to make an adjustment but I like to put it a little dimmer keeps it a little more out of the way the color matching aspect you know what I just leave that on always I find the feature really really useful I think you will too if you're not liking what it's doing adjusting to kind of the colors in your room or in your space the color of the lighting go ahead and change that kind of adjust it down audio is one of the most important aspects of your Google Nest smart display one of the things that many people like are the ability to have a start and an end sound when you say so you could hear that little start sound and then there was an end sound at the end this lets you know that the voice assistant heard you i like to turn that on all the time you can also turn on audio descriptions and screen readers they're going to work with certain aspects of the display not all so you got to test those out for yourself now again a default music speaker this is where you can set any of the other speakers around this because this isn't the most powerful device so if you have a group of speakers or a pair of speakers you can set that in here and it becomes that becomes the default music speaker when you say play music or play Foo Fighters. It will just play on that speaker. What you're also seeing inside here is the ability to pair a Bluetooth speaker. So this is where you can start and it will actually scan for devices. So I'm going to flip this here and it's going to scan for other Bluetooth speakers in order to pair with and if you do that and then you select that speaker as your base one or as your default one then you can play to that bluetooth speaker all the time as long as they stay paired again we have the equalizer and then there is the alarms and timers now when you set an alarm that is regular and occurring you will actually see the little bit of interface here it's not a full management panel as i make this video yet but you can see that you can adjust the alarm and timer volume in the app as well as on the device so you have both of those options uh, for kind of separating that alarm and timer volume from the standard volume adding a device to groups you know what what this does is this lets you create a much better sound experience in your home and everything kind of synchronizes so you know what I'm going to add this to the main bed group I've already created that and if I'd like I can create a device group here down at the very bottom of this interface so you can add it to other groups you can add it to multiple at the same time and hit save or you can create a new device group and add a bunch of speakers to that first group so if I hit create I have to name it and then I choose the different speakers that are in that group you can also edit groups which I'll show you in a little bit but I'm just going to add it to the main bed group and then whenever I ask to play on main bed group or if I set that group as the default speaker it will play on all of those speakers group delay correction is a really hard thing to explain but when you try to play music on a group of speakers one of them might be a little more delayed than the other and so Google's giving you this ability to adjust the delay so this is delaying as I move to the right it's delaying by seven milliseconds the response or the audio response or the audio sound coming out of this speaker so every time I adjust that up or down I'm changing the synchronization of my group so what you're going to have to decide is if you're hearing you know anywhere in your room that you're normally listening to speakers if you're hearing a bit of an echo this is where you come and you do it per speaker so you try to get that one synchronized with another one that you like and then you kind of go to the third speaker or the fourth speaker and you go through this process to get them all synchronized and it sounds great once you get it working paired Bluetooth devices now this is where you can pair your phone so I'm going to enable the pairing mode on this display and now on my tablet or my smartphone I can go into my Bluetooth settings and I can pair a new device so what this allows me to do is choose the bedroom display and now we're pairing the two devices together the nice thing about this once I've done this pairing process is I can always say to the Google Assistant on this Nest Hub hey pair uh, enable Bluetooth 
There, it just did it. Now, so now if I play music content here from this, it will start to play on this display. That's a really great way to play from any music service that you'd like to use. And when I'm done, I can just say, disable Bluetooth. Sure, Bluetooth is disconnected. So I've disabled Bluetooth on this and I can enable that at any time, that's great. But I can also review the different paired Bluetooth devices. Now what happens when you enable pairing in, with that voice command on this device is it looks for the very top device and that is the last device that was paired with your Google Nest Hub. So if you go and you get a tablet, it'll sit above my Pixel 4 XL when I do that initial pairing process and I've put them together and they're working together. So it will always go to that last one that you tried to pair with. There's no way to make that adjust. So what you would have to do is then manually inside of a device like this, go into the Bluetooth and try to pair directly, turn off that old tablet or something that you were using before. So it's a bit of a management process when you want to switch between Bluetooth devices, but in general now I can just enable and start playing music from my device. One really important aspect of the voice assistant is that this device can lower the volume when it's listening. So you just gotta get that initial wake word out there and get it to hear you. And then it kind of lowers the volume when it's playing music or other content. And that gives you the ability for this device to actually hear you. The other thing that can give you the ability for this device to hear you is the sensitivity. So if you're finding it's not listening to you, you wanna head a little bit more sensitive and if you're finding that it's hearing you too often or it's you're having spurious wake-ups that you didn't mean, well, you can make it less sensitive and this allows you to adjust it per device. So there's an adjust more devices down here and I'll show you later where there's a whole list of them that you can adjust. Now, for now, again, I'm gonna leave it at the default. I find this device hears me really well in almost all situations and that lower volume in conjunction, those two settings, make this pretty good. The voice and video call segment, because we already set that up, I can just unlink Duo from this device. That's all I need to do, or that's all I can do from this segment. The other aspect here is the remove device button. I don't find that all that useful. I just factory reset when I wanna pull something out of the Google Home application. You can decide to use that if you want, but again, I don't get it. I'm gonna take you around the Google Home application and I hate this part because I have to blur out a lot of things in editing, but I also like this part because it's going to teach you just generally how to navigate through the application. Now, the one thing I'll tell you is you need the Google Home app, but it often helps to have the Google Assistant app and I'm finding that it has become an important part of my Android phone. It can also help you with shortcuts and Siri on Apple iPhones and iPads. So go ahead and get both of those apps and log into the same account. At the very top left, you will find the add button. So there was a plus there and really I can set up devices. This is where I can invite home members, create new speaker groups if I'd like really quickly and even create new homes. And sometimes homes help you to kind of manage the organization of your overall application experience. You can also add in music, video, radio, podcasts, which we haven't even talked about yet in the video really. And you can add in Nest Aware and then check on rebates and pro services. So if you're someone who has you know, a Nest thermostat or you wanna get one, sometimes you need a pro there and they can connect you with HVAC specialists as well if you're having problems or your Nest thermostat has actually told you that you're having problems. So really great opportunities there. Once in a while I tap on the offers thing, I have yet to ever see something in there. But this is how you add almost everything into the app. And I'm just gonna go into setting up device really quickly. What you'll see here is a new device, like a Chromecast, a Nest speaker like the Nest Hub here, or a Lenovo smart display. If you go out and you buy one of those, you can add those. And the other aspect is Ye Light recently came out with new bulbs that Bluetooth connect. And actually I have one 
right above me right here and I demoed it on the channel. Those are called seamless setup with the Google Home application that don't require another application. So you can look for those devices and they become really useful for setup with products like this. The other thing is the works with Google. So this is if you're adding other devices like Philips Hue lights or uh, vacuums. You can see I have my Ecovacs vacuum. I have a Chipolo, which is a tracker. I have EWILink devices. It's actually a Bulldog valve. I have the Easy Viz cameras, my Harmony, uh, my Logitech Harmony Hub, geez, I can barely remember the name of that device, Hubitat, in my Instant Pot, I have smart plugs from iHome, LifeX, Philips Hue, Roku, smart life devices I've got a ton of, and you can see smart things I have a very lot of. So all of these things I've integrated with Google Home and that's how you add it. Now, the quick way to do that is to search for something. So if we're looking for uh, LifeX, I'll go ahead and try that typing again. I can go ahead, type that in, and it will find the service in general, and then you just tap on it, put in the credentials that you're using for that account, and it brings in the new service. We'll go through that more detailed later in the video, but I just wanted to give you that there's kind of two aspects to that setup device. The homes, you can actually tap and switch between your different homes, and if, if you have different devices in those that will help you. This little button here is present sensing, so I can set my home to away and it will activate a routine actually that turns off a bunch of lights in my home and a bunch of smart plugs to make sure when I leave that uh, everything's set the way I would like it. Now, I'm actually using present sensing on my phone, so this all happens automatically, but you can set that if you'd like in the app. Anytime you come into the application, right up here at the top, you're going to find anything that Google kind of already knows you have set up in your home. How they're doing this is essentially magic at this point, but they know I have Home Assistant here and I could tap on that. That's a quick way to add that service. You also saw before it knew the Nest Hub was ready to be set up and it will give you options to invite people to homes and, and do things like that. These different quick buttons show up based on what you have available in your country to manage. So lighting is very easy to tap that button and hit off on all lighting in your home. I won't do that because all of my lighting here will go off, but you can also go throughout your home and turn on and off lighting with those radio buttons. The media screen is very good at this point and it allows you to play music to different devices. Now, what I'll tell you is that to start it from this screen isn't great. Where it is good is when you've started music on one of these, it shows up here and then you can manage the which speakers are playing on. You can actually tap on the different ones and it will add that speaker on the fly. You can also add speakers on the fly on the display and that's a really great way to manage it too. But here you will see music, video, I've seen books on here, uh, yeah, podcasts as well and radio. The ability to call home is basically a one tab button and I'm not gonna do that because it's gonna play on all of my speakers, but this allows you to call all of those speakers you've connected with Google Duo. The ability to broadcast as well allows you to broadcast to all of your speakers. There's better commands to use if you just wanna broadcast to one speaker. You can actually say broadcast to bedroom display and it will do that. now. The way you could do that in the application is by hitting this little microphone button. Broadcast to bedroom display. Hello automators. Hello automators. Now what you might have noticed there is that it it went to my son's bedroom display and this bedroom display. And I have the ability to respond on device if I'd like. So you can kind of have a conversation back and forth if you'd like in that way. Or you can just use that broadcast button to broadcast to everything.
The next spot is the thermostat control, so I can go into that and I can adjust my thermostat if I'd like. I can also go and see my cameras very quickly. Now you can see I have those turned off because when I come home, my presence sensing deals with that for me. Now I have a Wi-Fi button and that's because I have Nest Wi-Fi. You may not have that aspect of this application. That's okay. The next segment is routines. Now routines are all of your different routines. You're gonna see I have just a few, but here's my home and away. These are the presence sensing ones. We can go into those and we can make adjustments. There's a whole segment in the video on routines coming. So stay tuned or maybe jump ahead if you wanna get into that. Now the next segment is this settings panel. And what happens here in the Google Home app is you have a bunch of different settings. So in here, these are called your home settings, and I would say that in general, they're helping you manage the whole home aspect of your life. Up in the top right, you have the manage your Google account settings, and that is for things like privacy and other aspects related to your specific account. You can also tap that down arrow and any Google accounts that you have logged into show up here and you can switch between them and then they'll have access to the homes that you've allowed them to. So this is a quick and easy way for you to add in maybe your spouse's account into here and make sure that what they'll see on their phone looks right to you. So that's just one way to maybe manage things. Now, in here is also the home app settings. So these are basic settings for the home application. I would tell you that email notifications is very important. These are just tips and tricks and you can see that preview program that we've turned on will get emails for as well. Now what you can do is clear the saved Wi-Fi network if you're finding that being a problem during setup of device, you could clear that out so you get that uh, opportunity to put in your password again. You can also clear the app location. So this is the locations that you've set for home and your within your devices. So that allows you to kind of change everything over. Partner connections, this is a building segment. And what you're going to find in most cases is that if you've connected your Nest devices, there are things that show up here. So Samsung SmartThings for me, and Amazon's voice assistant. Those are controlling my Nest devices, so I've given them direct, uh, direct partner connection. You can manage that there, but I would say in general, you're not gonna touch that. If you're ever getting support, here's a customer support code. So that can be very important to get the right kind of help. There's also all of the privacy FAQs and terms of service and all of that about the app and app info if you're ever asked what version you are on for the app. Down below all of these settings are your different rooms and you can tap into each room and then you have the controls there. You can obviously see all of the controls here as well and it's a pretty quick turn on and turn off for things like lights. Plus you can go into lights and you have more controls here and anywhere you see blue text, you can tap on to get deeper into the, the control. So if I wanted, I can go all the way in to this. You can see this one's not even connected anymore, but you can tap in to go and adjust additional things on all of these lights. All of your other devices have different settings. Now, this is a Nest camera. I can change the name here, although if you never change that name, it comes from the other application. So in general, I leave the names and adjust them in the other application and then I ask my Google Assistant to sync my devices and it will bring in that new name. Once you change it here, it's changed and it won't synchronize from that other application. You can see I can change the home and the room and I can unlink that service. So if you're done with WISE for any reason, you can hit that unlink and it will unlink that whole service and all of those devices. You can see that there is a little bit of animation going on. So the bedroom display says it's playing music or playing something because I'm casting to it for the purposes of this video. So you will see little animations, little differences as you turn on lights. You can see that the icon looks a little bit different. It's the same with outlets. So when you turn off those, 
Okay, that's great. Now that one is on or off and I can see that little green component. You can also see, you know, different things like meters or this is this is just a sensor that's coming over from SwitchBot and you can see that I have the humidity and the temperature there. So you have all of this aspect to jump in and out of all of these devices. Now, one thing that's really interesting about smart plugs and switches and devices kind of like that is you have the ability to change the device type. So this is a really important aspect. You can see the garage switch one. Now that device looks like a fan in here and yet garage switch two and garage switch three, which are actually all on the same multi-plug, they just look like smart plugs. So when I go into that and I go into the settings, you can see that device type and this allows you to change the device type. The reason that's important is because you can then schedule the device depending on what it is with your voice. So I could say, turn on the fan for 15 minutes to the Google Assistant and it would turn on, or I would have to say, turn on the garage switch one for 15 minutes and it would turn that on and then turn it off in 15 minutes. I can also use things like turn it on at 5 p.m. and I can put that in routines to have that said in the morning but not have it execute until later in the day too. So you have all of these different options based on that device type. Now that's really complex and I have a better video down below that will help you work through that. Cameras, you can go right into, if they're available to see, you're able to go right into that. So I can turn on that camera, it's a Nest camera, and it will connect and then give me a direct view into that camera. Now that the camera's on, I can see it's live up in the top left, and I have the ability to hit that microphone button and actually speak through the camera, through the Google Home app, and the Nest application is still important, so you can see it up in the top right there. Uh, you can switch over and manage the device further there, but you also have a number of settings, again, here in the Google Home application, the ability to deal with video recording, video history, and of course those general room and home settings as well as the name. Many of your cameras though, if they're from other makers that maybe don't integrate really well, you can't even see them in the application. You can ask to see them here by asking for the name, show me that device name. Down at the bottom here, towards the bottom, not all the way, is our set of groups. Now, if you have a group that you have created, you can manage the volume on that group. This looks just like your speaker interface. You can also change the uh, sound settings or the sound level on each of those devices within the group here. Now, you can also go into the settings and you can see the devices and you can choose the devices or delete the group. So if I choose devices, I can go ahead. Now this is my display group, so I wanna add my bedroom display. I wanna add my kids bedroom display. Maybe I wanna add that Chromecast and I can hit save and now all of those devices are within that group and when I ask it to play, on the display group, it will play on all of them. Down below those, you're probably going to find the linked to you segment. And these are devices that haven't been placed in a home and a room. And that means, you know, for someone like me, I got a lot in there because I'm always bringing stuff in and out. So if you've got those, you can go into any of them and then you can quickly adjust their settings, add them to a home. You can see that ability right there and then it will prompt you to add it to a room as well. The biggest setting screen on the whole thing are the assistant settings. Now, right off the bat, you have the ability to search the settings because you might get lost here as we go. You have the ability to manage your Google account and there's more details about your data in the assistant. We'll get to a bit more of that within the privacy section of this. Now. The popular settings are at the top. So voice match, languages, personalization, routines, reminders, music, and then you have these bigger segments called you and your devices there. 
Once you get past that, this is essentially going to be done alphabetically. So it starts with the sensitivity setting for going into all of your different devices and adjusting their sensitivity setting. So if I want, I can adjust this device and then come back. So this allows you to quickly deal with a number of items. But after that, you're basically seeing that it is organized alphabetically and it becomes relatively easy to find. Again, if you can't find something, you can use the search settings. You might also find that it is kind of closed off where it says nothing below the devices tab here. You want to hit that view all settings and that will give you the full list. Now let's move on to how to personalize this device a little bit for all of us. And I think this is an important aspect for making this device work just a little bit better for you. This is where we're going to start to get into some of the features that will change how the device works. I'm in the Google Assistant settings. That's the big setting screen here. Now, the very first one is that sensitivity setting. This will change how your device listens to you. So go ahead and make those adjustments. If you're finding it waking up too much, you wanna drop down that sensitivity. If you're finding it's not hearing you when you start the, the or use the wake words, then you wanna turn up that sensitivity. So you'll have to play with that and make that adjustment for all of your speakers. This is one of the quick ways to kind of personalize how it hears in a space. It might not always hear great. Another big feature is continued conversations. Now what happens here is you can use that wake word, give a command, and then it will answer that command or deal with what you've requested or give you back some information if you're just asking general information, and then it will actually sit and listen for another command. And this can help you to kind of follow up. So if I ask about Scarlett Johansson and then I ask how old is she with continued conversations, I will get those two pieces of information without having to say how old is Scarlett Johansson. So continued conversation helps in a couple of ways, not just with the secondary listening without having to use the wake word again, but it also helps to kind of tie things together. Now you can set that by the phone if you have a phone like me that can listen and the shared devices. So this is all your devices. It is an on or off on all of your devices. So you gotta pick. The next aspect is languages and you can set two languages on your display and English United States opens up a number of different settings or a number of different capabilities for you. And a lot of people might say, I can't get continued conversations. Change your primary language to English United States and you should have that uh, options show up in the application. You can always add a second language that you would like to speak with the display on as well there. So that is one way to kind of customize the device a little bit more to how your family works with the device. But setting English United States there can be a pretty good trick for opening up a lot of options for you. One of the ways to really customize how your Google Nest display sounds is by changing the Google Assistant voice. Now you can select any of these different color ones and then it starts playing what it sounds like. Now this is one of the reasons that we select English United States as the first language. And unfortunately I can't help you if you have other languages selected, but this allows you when you're speaking English to the device to have all these different choices. There's actually quite a number and different languages will have less choices here. So if you're not seeing British racing green, that might be because you have a language that doesn't have it available. We've already dealt with sleep sensing in general, but there is a whole wellness aspect and this part of the application will definitely expand as we go. Now, sleep right here, the sleep sensing component, well, there's Google Fit, you can disconnect or manage the data connection and Fitbit, you can actually connect your device just for sleep data to come in and be available for you to ask about here. So you don't necessarily need to use the sleep sensing on here. That will be impactful when Google includes this device in the uh, subscription service in 2022, but 
right now, you maybe don't need the Fitbit to connect because you have a Nest Hub second generation. You can use sleep sensing to get that data. So they'll show you the devices that have the sleep sensing. And then if you want to get the personalized sleep suggestions, you can actually hit that manage button and check your setting there. I have it turned on because I think that's one of the most useful components here. Now, fit data, this is the data that's going across and back here between the Google Nest Hub and Google Fit. So you can see all of these things that are available and coming back and forth. Now, weight and things like that, that's coming from a sleep uh, a weight scale that I have that's separate from this. So not all of this is necessarily uh, data that you'll be accessing right away on this device. Those kinds of things will probably come in over time to give you a better look into your wellness. But right now that's just a management of fit data. The proactive health and fitness results, this is actually giving the ability to show the results on these different displays. So I've allowed certain ones to show my health and my fitness results from all that data coming from Google Fit. Right now, in a lot of cases, that is just the sleep data, but you can actually turn this on fully in the personal results. So, but one thing is you can hit that turn on proactive results here and it's giving you another whole segment here to manage things by device. The notification segment is really important in a couple of ways. So we've already kind of talked about email updates coming, but you can get much more with this phone segment when you ask for things. So sometimes when I request information, it's too long, it's too hard to kind of capture everything on this device. So I can get answers to questions sent to my phone and you'll get that link. The other thing is direct links to settings. So if I ask, how do I turn on continued conversations? You can turn continued conversation on or off in the Google Home app. At the top right, tap your profile. So what I have here in my phone is actually the ability to get quickly to the settings. So I can hit that settings and it'll take me straight to continued conversations. That's a quick way to get to some of the features and that's only through the extended responses here. Now, the other things you can do are subscriptions. I don't find that really useful anymore. I used to subscribe to the weather, but I've got that enough places at this point. Reminders as well. So if you want notifications for reminders, sent to your phone here you go and if somebody in your household has assigned you a reminder you can get a notification for that uh, help with tasks is something just developing really package delivery I've had that a few times when I bought from the Google store you can get those kinds of updates on your phone again event reminders and things like that that's a little more easy to tie in if you're using your Google account to book through a service not that we can go to any events anymore anyways the tips and tricks segment you know what you're not going to get a lot of those if you don't want those kinds of notifications on your phone i understand turn it off feedback for short surveys uh partner services so you know amazon or smart things i showed you those before you might get notifications for those links one more thing that's really great to personalize the display itself is the snapshot segment. And you can deal with all kinds of things that you maybe do or don't wanna see showing up on that. So reminders, reminders in emails, you have the commute time, which I don't find useful anymore. I kinda know about how long, but it does take traffic into effect. So if you want those kinds of things, you also get the weather and the calendar events showing up on the display. All of those different concert movie tickets when that matters someday again, you can get those. Now, the recommendations, these are more around segments within the display. So recipes, movies, those kinds of things showing up. Travel, you have the car reservations, currency converters, all of that can show up in here as well. And you can turn that off as well. 
interests, you will set, you know, sports teams in the application stocks and you will set your stock portfolio in there if you want. And that's all kind of connected to your Google account. For stocks, you have to kind of go to finance.google.com and set up which ones you want to see. But there is a segment inside of the application right here for setting which ones you'd like to track. What's really interesting about going into stocks is this is where you can kind of set your sports teams or other topics. So I've selected a sports team and I can also hit all. Now, what happens here is this is actually pulling from your Google account based on activity and all of these different topics. What is, what the result of this, if you kind of turn on and off these check marks, what happens is those interests won't necessarily show up in news and video recommendations and even music recommendations in some cases. We've already talked a number of times about voice match and weather is something you probably want to adjust whether you like it in Celsius or Fahrenheit. Probably the biggest way to personalize this is the you section and this takes you into a number of those other assistant settings there. Now the basic info allows you to set a nickname and what you might find throughout the video is this thing calls me big boy and that's because I've put a nickname in there. The birthday you can stick that in there you get a special greeting on your birthday that's kind of nice and you can set in a phone number again this is like the eighth place you can set in a phone number if you'd like. Your places becomes more impactful as a segment here. So what you can do is add the different places that you go to on a regular basis. And I really like to do this with a number of places that I frequent because then I can ask how long it takes to get to that place at any time. I can ask for directions and I can do it by name. Now the other thing with your places is it opens up a number of personalization options options for uh, routines or voice commands. So one of the things you can do is add a new place. You can go ahead and you can search a location. I'm going to flip my phone up here for a second to add that location. Now when I add a new place I can search by the address and then I can name the place and then I just hit OK. Whatever I name the place is what will show up down here. So you can see my home and I can hit quick buttons for check traffic or navigate to. But I also have these other ones down here that say best pizza ever and yo mama's house and best grocery store and your house cause drinks. Now, those are names that I could use with the voice assistant in order to get directions or I could use them as location-based reminders. That's really powerful. I have a whole video for customizing your response down in the description below, but adding these little places in becomes really impactful to how your whole life works. How you move around the world transportation method. So how do you get to work? How do you go to other places? And again, you can get to those notification segments again and to your places. So there's lots of these little ways back and forth through the app, but go ahead, set your transportation mode. That's what they use for directions navigation. Your people is a really important segment here for customizing this device and your whole home. Now, I can go into each person, I can set them as a household contact and they have to be synchronized as contacts in order to show up here. So if you're not having anybody show up or you can't add a person from your list of contacts, that's because you haven't synchronized it. I'll show you, uh, or that should have happened in the initial setup process. I don't think I can show you anymore because I've synchronized so long. but. Uh, in any case, when you go into a person that you want to create or to set as part of your people, well, you get their contact loaded in here, you're choosing them, and then what you're doing is you're saying, okay, how am I connected? I can choose from a number of different options, and I've just selected friend here, so you can even add in your friends, you can set in a birthday, and you can put in their home address. You can see I've kinda just 
put in an address at this point. I can also set them within my family group so they would be able to do a little bit more there. It's, it's more around you know reminders, assignable reminders, things like that at this point. I can always send people photos if I'd like so I don't really use that view family photos component but I can set them as a household contact and that puts them on the screen as a quick couple of taps to get there. The other thing once you've set them as a household contact you can set a nickname for them so I can ask to call Sneaky Pete or I can ask for directions to Sneaky Pete's house. Those things are available. I can also remove them from my people. One of the nice things here when you set the relations between you so I can always say call my dad or call my mom because they're in the application and it's a quick way to call those people without thinking about their name or their nickname or whatever I've set in the app. It just happens. Payments isn't something I've been using a lot but you can put in payment information in there. I'm not even going to bother because there's really no stores or not much you can do with it. Food and drink does help a little bit. For myself I set the gluten free here and that helps me get better recipe recommendations. Accounts is a really important aspect here. Now this is how you can get more calendars added in. So you can add a new account. This is only Google accounts. It's still really very much restricted that way but you can add in those other Google accounts that allows you to get calendar information out of those other accounts. Once you've dealt with everything in the you section, the personalization section is kind of the last thing. Now there's those personal results uh, and because I'm on my phone here it's a whole segment for the phone but you will find down below all your other devices are here so whether you want personal results turned on. So you know what personal results I would say leave that on that's going to get you all those calendar things. The lock screen personal results again that's on this so can I get those when my screen is locked and even suggestions on the lock screen. So there's a lot of things there. Headphones, if you're connecting either Bluetooth or 3.5 mil, if that's still a thing for you, uh, you can have that there. Each of the devices can be set as to whether or not they're getting personal results as well. So you can turn that on and off per speaker here. Let's get into music. Now there is a ton you can do with the Google Assistant in music and I'm going to try and cover it all but we're going to start with the music settings that you have available to you. Now I'm in the Google Assistant settings and I'm going to use that page mostly but there are a number of ways that you can get to the music segment. Now you can select your different providers. You can set no default provider but what that means is you have to say which service you'd like to use each time. So your command becomes play music from YouTube Music or play music from Spotify. Now you can see that I can link additional accounts here by tapping on that little chain link that's sitting over there and then I've got to actually put in my credentials to that service and then that will give me the second option to play on those other services. So there I've just logged in a second account and you can see that I have an unlink button once I've logged in a couple of these. YouTube Music, that's probably going to be the one that a lot of you use with this service. You can use all the other ones that you see down available here. I've already shown you the equalizer setting in your device and in the Google Home uh, speaker groups as well but here we have the ability to go into the speaker and go into those equalizer settings to adjust that as well. Plus within the settings we have those audio settings here that lower the volume when listening so if you're playing music and you want to change something you can use the wake word and then it lowers that volume you can turn that on. Within groups you can add your device to the different groups so here's how you can add them to it if you'd like and then you hit save and here you have the group delay correction so if you're finding this speaker is ahead of others then you actually increase this number here and it will delay the music coming out of that speaker so 
can help you to synchronize. You have to do that per speaker though. Playing from a smartphone or a tablet to allow you to play any of the music services, this is a really important feature for a lot of people. We can go in through the audio section here in the device settings. We can go into paired Bluetooth devices. You can see I've already done my Pixel 4XL. Now what you do for a process here is you request the Nest Hub to enable pairing mode. So you can say, the wake word and then enable Bluetooth and it will turn on that Bluetooth radio. So if we've already used the wake word and then we've said enable Bluetooth or press that button, then on our smartphone, we go into Bluetooth settings and then I'm going to hit pair new device. Then the device will search for what in this case is my bedroom display and I'm going to tap on that and then you'll get this request to pair the two devices. Now, they are connecting and then you'll hear a little sound and they will become paired. And now you have the ability to play from whatever service you'd like on your phone. This can be connected with other speakers throughout your home. And what you're doing here is choosing a default music speaker. Now, when you hit the pair Bluetooth speaker, it will scan for other Bluetooth speakers that are available. And you have to make sure that your other device can be found. So it's Bluetooth has to be turned on, but then you can just select it and it will pair the two. And if you have it selected as your default speaker, the two basically will stay connected. If it's not staying connected, you can enable Bluetooth through that voice command again, and then it should pair to that other speaker if it's ready to be paired to again. But this allows you to use those Bluetooth speakers anytime. Of course, you could set other devices as your default speaker or groups, and this becomes really important for the commands that you give that I'm about to go through here with you. So if you choose the display group, well then it will always play on that display group if you just say, hey, play music. Many of the applications you will use will have a cast button on them, and You'll have to check your own favorite application for this, but when you use that cast button, then you're able to pick from specific devices or from the groups of devices as well. And you might find speakers from other makers in that segment as well. So the cast button becomes really powerful. It doesn't require Bluetooth. You can just use cast if you're on the same Wi-Fi as a device or it's cast capable. So it's gonna depend on the device, but you'll find a lot there. Once you are playing music, the media page becomes really good. And this goes for video or podcasts or radio or books or whatever. And you can actually manage a lot here. So let's walk through some of the commands you can use. And this gets pretty wild. But we're just going to start with the most basic one, which is play music. Playing some music on YouTube music. Now, before I get a copyright strike, I'm gonna turn that off so that we're not having that play, but I wanna take you through the basic interface here for music control very quickly with this smart display. Playing royalty-free music on YouTube Music. For controlling music, you'll find a very similar thing for videos on on the display as well especially on youtube now this interface can change slightly depending on the service you're using but in general you have the ability to drag along and change the spot you are in the song or whatever's playing plus you have the ability to play and once you go to other tracks you'll have the ability to go back right here and forward a track you also have this more options, but right now not a ton inside that. The other component is that you can pull up and you're able to see what's next in the whole list. So we're able to jump across to other music very quickly.
The next major aspect is this cast button and this will show a little bit differently on certain displays at this point but this is the brand new interface that you have available here. Now I can adjust this device's uh, audio very quickly and I can go down and I can add in other speakers as I see fit. So you can see me just adding in these other speakers and as they come online I have the ability to adjust their volume as well as the entire group volume on the display as well. I can also switch directly to a group. So if this is something I want to do in this device, you can see this specific one is included in these two groups. So this becomes a very quick interface for getting to those specific groups that you've put the display in. So YouTube Music was the default service and that means when I asked it to play music, I was able to select that. But if I'd like to change to Spotify, it's just the wake word and then play music on Spotify. And the same holds true as we get more in depth or more detailed with the commands we're going to give. So the first command you might want is an artist. And so we can just say, Play Foo Fighters. Playing Dave Grohl on YouTube Music. Let's take a second and check out some of the Now, if I wanted to play that on Spotify or another service, I could, of course, tack that on to the end of the command. If you have playlists inside of YouTube Music, you can request those by name. So, play USS on YouTube Music. Okay. Here's your YouTube music playlist called USS. If you're having trouble getting one of those playlists to play, you can actually request by saying my playlist named X on YouTube music or my playlist named X. You don't need that on YouTube music if it's set as your default music service. Now, you can do these things by genre and you can have other segments, other ways to kind of break things up. But one of the ways I really like to use these speakers is by kind of setting a timeline that the device will play. So you can actually tack on a for 15 minutes within any of your commands or whatever time length you would like until a certain time as well works. So you have these options for just adding more and more to the command that you give this device. So let's go really complex here and give it a bunch of things. Play my playlist USS for three minutes. Sure. Here's your YouTube music playlist called USS. Bedroom display will stop playing in three minutes. Of course, with any of these segments, if you have other questions about commands you can give or different pieces of functionality or capability that you're looking at, leave those down in the comments. But for now, I'm gonna skip over to a little discussion on casting, which we've already talked a little bit about within the music segment, but you can do this for many video applications and this does not require you to link that uh, account necessarily. So YouTube is a great example. You can be logged into YouTube on any sort of account, hit that cast button, and then it will play on these smart displays. Now moving into video, this is a really important segment and I'm going to start uh, again with the settings here. So I'm in the Google Assistant settings here and I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom and there is a videos and photos component. Now, you can see that I've already linked Netflix but Disney Plus didn't link at the start of this video so I'm going to hit that link and I'm going to hit link account. Now what it's trying to do is connect my Disney Plus account to this in order to allow me to play content from that. And so now what I'm doing is I'm linking the Google Assistant with the profile. Play Falcon and the Winter Soldier on Disney Plus. Sure, playing the Falcon and the Winter Soldier on Disney Plus. The other thing that you can link in most 
locales or most countries is YouTube Kids. And then down below, you can actually see the Photos component. So this allows Google Photos to be used as part of that photo frame. You need that radio button turned on. Now again, you have those cast buttons that you can use in different applications to cast directly to the screen. And then we have all the different voice commands that we can use, including requesting specific shows from things like Disney Plus or Netflix. If you use those services, you can request those specific shows. The other thing that's very powerful is YouTube. So you can request your favorite YouTuber sitting right here. You can look at their most recent video at any time and you can conduct searches as well. So both of those as kind of commands that you can give to get more content out of this device work well. Using YouTube on the Nest Hub Smart Display is quite easy. Now I'm going to head to the Media tab and you can right away see YouTube videos that YouTube thinks you're going to like in general. Unfortunately, my kid has been playing far too much Preston Plays, but I can also tap in and go to other recommended videos and then you're going to see some stuff. Now it's also getting filled with a lot of YouTube music right now. I expect this to get worked out by Google or else we're not going to have a lot of use here for those of us who play YouTube music. But this is a quick way to get to some of the YouTube content. The better way I find to access YouTube is to ask by topic. So show me videos on smart homes. So of course we have some good search results here for you to work through and pick whatever video you'd like, but maybe you want to look by creator. So show me videos by automate your life. So it's done it pretty well. It hasn't necessarily just given me options from my own channel here, but you can see that it's pretty well filled up just based on how we do things on YouTube in general. But you might want to just see the latest video from your favorite creator. So let's try and do that. Play the latest video from Automate Your Life. Sure, playing the latest video from Automate Your Life on Bedroom Roku. That's a really important aspect. You saw it actually started on the Bedroom Roku. That's my default TV and you can set that in the Google Home application under the device settings for this display. So instead, let's make sure that we play that video here. Play the newest video from Automate Your Life on Bedroom Display. Playing the newest video from Automate Your Life on YouTube. That are available with this interface because we... Open Automate Your Life on YouTube. So I think this was the best way to actually get to the channel page. While it looks a lot like it, once we get under the hood, we find some new comp... So in the past, I've used commands like open the latest video or open the newest video or play the newest video by Automate Your Life to get to this spot where it's playing my latest video or your favorite creator's latest video. But I have found that it works a little bit better if I just use that previous command there. Now, once you're in here, you have a full control interface again. So not only can we go to the latest video, but we can go back in history and go through the different videos and this allows you to look through a creator's entire channel. YouTube tends to be a really great source for news, but you probably want some basic news. Now within that Google Assistant settings is a whole news section and there's a number of things you can do. You can see I've already added a number of these different news sources. Now what you can do is hit at the bottom the add news source. You can change your language and that will help you to kind of sort through some of the content here and then anyone that you would like to add you can just stick that checkbox next to and you will find that video is available on smart displays on some of these sources. So I've just added 
Reuters or Reuters or however you say that and down it is at the bottom of my news section. Now I can change the order of these so if that's a type of news I'd like to hear before TSN there I can go ahead change that and it's changed the order for me. You can see it's now slightly above TSN. From there, it's a simple command to request your news. Now, you can request specific news sources if you'd like. So, if you know the Sportsnet update is what you want to get first, or if you know that CBC News is the one that you want to get first, you can do those things. That news segment lets you bring in those specific news sources and it will also put those sources in the feed on the smart display itself more often. But what I have been using more and more of to manage things is I go into this stocks section and then instead of choosing stocks I choose all. And then there's all these topics that I follow and I can add or remove those topics and they will get rid of it on the smart display in a lot of cases. So if I want to follow Google or the Apple HomeKit system, I can do that. Plus I can add it as a technology company separate from following the stock specifically, smart devices, things like that. So as I add those in, they get brought into my feed and I just eliminated real estate economics here because I don't want to hear about any more of our housing prices. And when you do that, you can get rid of topics that will generally show up on the interface here. Lots of that data is actually coming from your Google account and it's based on the web and uh, history or the web and activity on the web component of your account there, which I'll show you in the privacy segment of this video. Another big thing that has changed recently is that podcasts have come to the Google Smart Displays. Now, Google Podcasts gets linked with your base account there whatever you put in as you were setting up the device, but you can add in Spotify and you can again set no default so that you would have to say, play my podcast and you can go by play my podcast or you can go by ones that you've said you want to follow. Sure. Resuming TED Talks daily, the value of your humanity in an automated future. Kevin Roos on Google Podcasts. I find this easiest to do at podcast.google.com where I can follow the different podcasts. There's not really a great interface right here on the application to get to all those podcasts. You can see I'm, I'm not able to go in there and find them all. So what I found more useful is to go to that website and you can pick the ones you want to follow and then you can request them by name or just request your podcasts to play. Still in the base settings here, I'm going to give you the voice and video calls walkthrough. Now you can see your contacts. This is the most important segment for a lot of you. And as you set up Duo the first time, you were probably asked to synchronize your contacts. Or as you set up the device, you were probably asked for that. Now, call providers in the US is a little bit different. They're going to start giving you options here for services that you can connect. But you can see my own number can be used. And currently, I'm unlisted. But if I hit edit, I can add or change the phone number that's being used. Now this is during phone calls. So if you request uh, to call any of your contacts, it would actually show your phone number as the one making the call if you put it in here or you can use an unlisted number. So you've got to decide if you want to do that. You can add that in and then what happens is you get a text message just to verify that you're trying to use that. I'm not going to put that in right now. I don't find it all that impactful. The voice and video apps segment here, it allows you to connect a couple of other services. So I really like Google Duo. I've got a lot of contacts on there. And on my phone, I can make video or audio calls. My Nest Hub Max, I can make video calls. But Google Duo on this, it doesn't have a camera, so you can only make those audio duo calls. Now, overall, you can still link a Zoom account. And this is maybe something that you want to do. And when you go and you link this account, you can actually join Zoom meetings in a lot of cases. So all I have to do is put in my credentials and then I hit that authorize button. And now it has linked my Zoom account. So I'm able to join those Zoom meetings that are in my Google Calendar, which I'll show you a little bit later here. Uh, as events that I need to join. That's very easy and there's a whole interface for managing Zoom.
As we move over to Google Duo, which is more of a complicated setup because it's an actual application that you have to have installed on your smartphone and then you have to go through a little setup process to connect your Google account to your smartphone's phone number. Now, I'm not going to walk you through that entire process. It's quite simple and the app does that for you. And while Google Duo is only going to allow you to connect with up to 32 people, it still has some really interesting components and some really interesting use cases. Now, number one, you no longer are restricted only to the Nest Hub Max. You can use any of the Google Nest smart displays. Regional restrictions are reduced. You can use this in more countries than just the United States. And on top of that, you can create these groups. And what I think is really important about this is that if you know you have a set of siblings that you want to connect with on a weekly basis or a semi-weekly basis, a bi-weekly basis, whatever it is, you want to connect with them. Well, you can set up this group. And what's really interesting is when you create a group once and people have gone into that group or accepted a phone call from that group well they actually end up with that group on their smartphone and on their smart displays if they have them so it becomes something that everyone can then use from that point forward once you have duo on your smartphone there's a little more work that you have to walk through here so you have to connect that Google duo account to your Google home application so we're going to head into the settings and then into voice and video calls then you're going to go into video and voice apps and from here you'll find the ability to connect Google duo once you have done that you actually get to select Select a number of speakers and smart displays that you want to ring whenever someone calls you through Google Duo. So they will all ring at that time. You might want to think about downtime if this is something you have in your bedroom, but that's another discussion for another time. Now, as long as you have Google Duo notifications turned on, you're going to get that phone call through to your smartphone as well. Once you've done all that, and just because I want to confuse you, we're going to go back to the Google Duo application, and I'm going to walk you through one of those really important components of this feature. So that is the ability to create a group. So when you go back in there, you can see the ability to create a group, and it you will also see a list of groups that you have created in the past or that you have been a part of. Now, when you hit the create group button, you'll be able to choose up to 31 other people because no matter how much negative self-talk you have or you do with yourself, you count in that list of 32 people. So you select all those people and then you hit the next button down at the bottom and then you're going to be able to name the group and start the video or voice call. And what happens with this is all those people are basically rung up, whether it's on their smart displays, whatever device they have for a smartphone, it's showing up there for all of them and they can join at that moment. Now, if they don't join at that moment, they can actually go into the Google Duo application and they will see that there's a live call going on that they can join. Now there's some really interesting features within the application on Duo on your smartphone. So I just wanna walk you through a couple of those. There's filters, there's effects, those are fun, those are goofy in some cases. You can add those in as you're going through the call. But the thing I was the most impressed with, if someone does miss that initial call and you're, you're all chatting along here and you go, well, we really want that person to join the call, you can actually tap on them inside of the application to re-invite them and they will come back in in a lot of cases. Another great feature of all of this is that they don't have to use the video camera. Not everyone is necessarily comfortable. They can actually turn off their video camera and just use the audio component. They can still see everyone else on the call as long as they're looking at their smartphone or on the smart display. And speaking of those smart displays, remember earlier when I showed you that page where you could actually set which speakers could make and receive Google Duo calls, as long as you have set a smart display as capable of that, well, then you're able to receive those group calls here. Duo group call for Brian. 
Hmm. It even hey. said uh, duo group call for Brian, so it knew specifically it was for me because I was in, in this group. Now, the other thing you might want to do is make a Google Duo group call from a smart display, and you can do that, but you have to specifically request it with the correct Google Duo group call syntax. Google Duo, if you haven't linked it, it'll be showing up here as something that you can link, but I've already done that. Now, there's some basic call settings. There's message settings. I think those are actually more interesting because you can get video call messages from other people and then you can view them on the smart display here. Most of the rest of the settings here are actually based on your phone. So I'm not going to walk through those, the call settings, the notifications, the theme. That's all part of your phone. What's more important for you as someone using a Nest Hub here is the linked devices. Now, you can set any of these devices to what is essentially a yes, you can see my bedroom display is linked as a device that receives those duo phone calls. So it will ring. Now, you can't receive regular phone calls on this display. Only those duo calls can show up here for you to answer. There are now a number of games that you can get to by asking to play a game on your Google Assistant and you'll get a ton of options. General questions or general inquiries are one of the biggest power, uh, powerful features behind the Google Nest Hub and the Google Assistant in general. So we have the ability to ask for conversions, things like how many feet in a meter, or we can ask about stocks that we want to find out about. It's great to ask about navigation to places, and we've already talked about the Your Places segment. This is in the personalization section of our video here today. You can go and when you set up a your place, what you'll actually get is the ability to call those up by name. And if you set up the notifications right, then you will actually get a notification to your phone that takes you straight into your map application and gives you directions to those places. So very impactful there in terms of getting notifications. One of the biggest features on these smart displays and the speakers in general are reminders and you can request a reminder to be set at any time, but it's more than just that. So in the assistant settings, you can go ahead and you can see I'm using my <laughs> reminders to remind me to cancel things before they're going to cost me money. So I've got a few of those sitting here. Now, of course, I can add reminders at any time and it will bring up the interface and start me down that path. But what's important about this whole segment is how you can use the Google Nest Hub with this. There's a couple of specifics that I want to give you here. Number one, you can immediately say set a reminder for a time and a date and that will instantly put it in there and then we'll ask you what you want to have as the name for that reminder. But if you just say create a reminder, you get these open-ended questions that you can use uh, for some different purposes. Now, we've talked about your places a couple of times. That's in the personalization section of this video. But if you've created those your places, one of the things you can say is set a reminder and then say what the reminder is. And then it will ask you when you wanted to be reminded. And if you say when I arrive at the name of your place, what you will actually get is a location-based reminder. Now this requires Google Assistant on your phone and that location tracking being turned on. So that's why I say 
you got to have that Google Assistant application as well as the Google Home one. You can also say an address. So when I arrive at a certain address, that allows you to set a location-based reminder in, on something or for something that you don't have in your places. The other thing, obviously, you can do at that point is to say a date and time, and it creates that reminder for that. The other thing that I found really powerful within reminders is... If I'm setting a reminder to pay a bill, I can actually say the dollar amount. So really, really complex things can go into these reminders and that becomes very useful for a lot of people to remember, I have to pay my water bill for this amount on this day and then I don't have to go look up everything again when it comes to that day. We'll talk a little more about assignable reminders as we get into the whole family setup experience, but that is something that you can do. You can actually assign reminders to other people. There's an entire alarm management panel that definitely is better to use on the Google Nest Hub. Now, let me walk you through that alarm management panel, how you can set this up to create different alarms for different days with different features turned on. There's actually a lot you can do here. Show my alarms. It looks like you don't have any alarms. Well, that looks like something we need to fix. So let's go ahead and hit set an alarm. Now, you're going to be able to set the time and pay attention to the AM, PM sort of thing right there. You can't swipe in order to choose it, so tap on the letters AM or PM. Once you've hit set, go ahead and hit whether or not you want it to repeat on different days. Then hit set there again. The next things we can have a look at are the alarm tones, and there's a whole bunch of different sections here, including light, and you can play each one individually and then have a listen, and there's medium and more heavier tones, plus, there are the natural sounds that I think are something a lot of people will use. The next segment is the sunrise alarm, and this is just getting rolled out, and it's a little bit iffy as to whether it's working right now on all devices, but you can go in and choose the different lights that you would like to come on in a sunrise sort of effect. So this happens before your alarm goes off. Whatever bulbs or lights you set, will start to come on and will ramp up over time right up into the point when your alarm goes off. So choose those lights and then you can also have the on-screen sunrise effect. You can tap into that, make sure it happens, and you can have a pre-alarm sound. Now the sunrise window, this is how long everything takes to kind of slowly ramp up in the morning before your alarm. So set that and then make sure that that radio button is turned on in order to get the sunrise alarm to go. Now you can actually select the morning routine to run after you've dismissed your morning's alarm. Now that's the actual physical morning routine that is already pre-created and you can edit it in the Google Home application. Once you've done all of this, you can go back into that alarm management panel at any time, see all your different alarms that are turned on, and of course, go in and edit. Plus, you can delete the alarms. Next is the settings button. When we go in there, you have the alarm volume control, which you have on your smart display anyways but you also have the ability to change all of the alarm tones, the sunrise alarm, and the silence uh, length of time here. So if you want the alarm to stop ringing just after five minutes, go ahead and set that, but I'm probably not gonna get up. And there's your snooze length as well. Create a timer for pizza. Sure, pizza, for how long? One minute. Sure. A one minute timer called pizza, starting n
One of the most impactful features on this device is the calendar feature. And this is something that might frustrate you if you have an iPhone and you're using iOS. Unfortunately, there's not really a great way. I have an older video that shows you how to kind of synchronize things, but these days it's pretty tough with those iOS calendars. So what I'll say is you got to kind of figure out how you want to use your calendars in general in order to get the best out of your smart devices or your phones. So you're going to have to make this decision. But one of the things that we did earlier in the video is we went into the accounts segment and this allowed us to add a secondary account. If you'd like to do that to get a couple of Gmail accounts or Google accounts connected in here with those Gmail calendars, well, you can go ahead and do that. Now, once you have done that, there is actually a calendar segment here and we can choose the different calendars to be included within our overall calendar as we request to create items or we request what is on our calendar any given day. So for my first account, I have five calendars. You can see the one is grayed out because I set that as my default calendar when I initially did the setup here. But if I wanted to remove any of them, I could. And if I want to show more calendars from this account, I can go ahead and hit that. And then I have the ability to add in the other calendars here. Now, the second account that I added, you can see it here, and I get those other calendars that are available under that. So so I can select all of these, but I need to choose a default calendar to create events on and I can adjust that as I see fit. So you can make these adjustments to the calendars, but they all have to be those Google account calendars as of today. From there, you can add events or you can request what's on my schedule for today. They're also going to show up here based on the notifications or those uh, snapshot settings that you have way down here. So down towards the bottom, you have this snapshot section and this allows you to put in the calendar events and reminders that we just talked about. Those can show up as little quick things. You'll find the little tab up in the top right and you can then see what's coming up in your calendar really quickly. Plus it's on the display interface in a few ways too. There's a whole segment on the display that allows you to bring up recipes. So you can easily request any recipe, but one of the things you want to do is go into the food and drink settings here and select any of those that you would like to add in. So I've added in gluten-free because that's my diet at this point and I need those kinds of recipes. This gives me better recommendations for gluten-free recipes, either on the display or when I request. It's not perfect, so you gotta watch out for that, but you will see a little gluten-free sort of uh, display underneath recipes that fit your preferences. From there, the interface for running through recipes is really great. And as soon as you've selected one, you get the ingredients, you can walk through those different ingredients that you will need, and you're able to then go through the process step by step, have it read out, and you can always request the Google Assistant just to go to the next step, or you can use your hands if you'd like with the display. So it's completely controllable by your voice if you would like to do that with recipes. The notes and lists segment in the assistant settings here, this is a really impactful segment. So those shopping lists, we just talked about the ability to deal with recipes. Well, you can view your shopping list items. It's kind of going to a website, so you can always actually save that and come back at any time if you'd like to use that outside of the Google Home application. You don't actually need to come in here it's something stored online. Your notes and lists, you can tap into there and you will see all the different lists and notes. And again, it is a URL that you can save as a shortcut or send to yourself. So here's all the lists I have created. So 
reasons I don't like Google Home. That was kind of something I was thinking I was being funny for and created a list for. But these are all custom lists in a lot of cases. And you're noticing different icons there. Now what's going on is there's a couple of services you can connect. So my shopping list, that's the original one that I showed you. To do items, that's something that is not custom. And then these are custom lists. And I have this little plus button that I can go ahead and create a new note or if I'd like a new list. So I also have the notes segment here. So these are notes that I had created in the past, but those are being created in my notes and list provider in a lot of cases. So I'm using Google Keep. You can connect any of these other services here and you can choose to not sync with other services. So if you just wanna use the Google Assistant lists and notes, you can go ahead and do that but i've chosen google keep and when you tap on that you're going to have to link an account although it should just be using your google account with google keep it's these other ones that you'll have to link an account but once you've done that you have the ability to use commands like create a list and when you say that it will ask you the name of the list and then you'll get the option to add things to that list as long as you can remember the name of those lists you'll be able to uh, request at any time to add X to my custom list, and then you have to say that name. But if you don't remember the names of your list, you can actually just simply request Google to show you your lists. Just ask for that, and that's one of the nice things about having a smart display. You can tap in and you can actually manage those lists and remove items from the list very quickly. Plus then you know the name and you can go ahead and add something to that list. Create a new list. Okay, what do you want to call it? Reasons I don't like Google Home. Sure, starting a list called Reasons I Don't Like Google Home. What do you want to add? It smells funny. Okay. I made a list called Reasons I Don't Like Google Home and added Smells Funny. Add, you just smelled your smart speaker, didn't you? Sure, you just smelled your smart speaker, didn't you, on your list called Reasons I Don't Like Google Home. Anything else? No. Show my lists. You have quite a few lists. They're reasons... Remember my kid is a stinky one? Okay, I'll remember that. I remember you told me, my bike combination is number 10 than 14 than 18. For the first time now in a very long time, I'm going to use this setting screen. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I wanna go into Nest Aware. Now what Nest Aware gives you today depends on your country, but for the most part, Nest Aware is being used with Nest cameras in order to give you cloud recordings or cloud storage. Now, it's also giving you a feature like familiar face detection on the Nest cameras as well. And with a Nest, um, Nest Hub Max, you have a Nest camera on there. So that can be very beneficial. Now, you can manage the subscription here and they have some support Otherwise, that's about it with Nest Aware. As we get closer and closer to a true security system being created here within the Google Home application, 
presence sensing becomes more and more important. So we just talked about nest aware and presence sensing. That's going to kind of come together with routines to create something that we can do to automatically have our home set into uh, the position we want or turn on and off the devices we want when we're home or when we're away from home. Now, the first thing is to allow this home to use phone locations. And if this is your first time entering into this segment, you'll have a bit of a setup process to go through, but it's really just setting up these settings and you can always adjust these things later within the Google Home app. So you'll go through a bit of a setup process and really what you're doing there is choosing the actions that you'd like to take whenever you come home or leave home and that is based on allowing this home to use phone location so for everyone that you've connected here and you've given an account to and then you've turned on this presence sensing for their phone will be used to set the home into home or away mode whenever you have that radio toggle on and their phone set in here you can see as well, because I've integrated my Nest Protect, I have that as a potential motion sensor or as a presence sensor if I'd like to. And down at the bottom, I have the ability to delete all of the presence history that has been stored over time. Now I skipped over to the routine section because there's a couple of routines in here that are for that presence sensing or for that whole section here. Now here's my away household routine and what you can see is when I say to my assistant everyone's away or everyone's leaving I can use that as a command to kind of set my home and I can also use the presence sensing when everyone's away. So this is taking me back to that presence sensing part of the application. We don't need to see that again but down below is this routine will turn on my camera. So you can see it's turning on my kitchen max which is in my nest max my nest camera and then I'm turning off a lot of smart lighting and I can add additional actions at the bottom and then hit save anytime I would like I have a very similar routine with the home routine here whenever I go and I say someone's home or I use the presence sensing in these phones from that previous section, then this routine will do a bunch of things. You can see I don't have as many things going on here. I'm just turning off those cameras for privacy reasons, and then I'm turning on a few lights to light the entrance into the home. Privacy is a major component of the Google Assistant and using these types of devices in your home. You really need to focus on this as a part of your setup process. Now, you can manage Manage your Google account in this is in the Google Assistant application settings you can just manage your account in a bit of a different way there's a lot of things in here so you really I'm not gonna go through every component of this but this allows you to manage security and things for your whole Google account what we're more talking about today is the data in our voice assistant so this allows you to manage what is being recorded by Google on a regular basis what is not and also to delete things like your activity so one of the things we talked about earlier was you could use uh, the Google Assistant to kind of create memories and when you do that kind of a thing it actually shows up as activity here and you can go into any of these activities and you can deal with it so you can search for activity of a specific type but here you said you can see I said to set a reminder and I can just simply delete that I can also go up here and delete a whole day if I'd like to delete that day I can delete yesterday and I can continue to go on plus I have this delete Google Assistant activity where I can delete custom ranges or and and or set up automatic deletion so this is really an important aspect where you can auto delete activity older than a certain timeline so three months 18 months 36 months or I can set a non auto or a no auto delete now the reason I'm going to say you don't necessarily just want to do that all the time or constantly delete all of your activity is because this device learns from you so does the Google Assistant and it will get better and better over time if you're not just instantly deleting that data do I think setting it on an auto delete of three months is detrimental 
Not really. If you're using this regularly, don't worry about that kind of a thing. That would kind of be my recommendation because you're not leaving all your data hanging out there. There are more filters that you can go through here and you can filter by assistant activity or Google activity. There's a ton of different things and it's even a better interface on a PC. So if you wanna go there, you can just go to account.google.com and go into the privacy section to manage these things as well. Just make sure you're logged in to that same account. Now, web and app activity. This is kind of just scrolling down here. This is something that you basically need to have turned on to have the voice assistant work. It's almost entirely required at this point. And you can go in there if you wanted to try and turn it off, you could, but as soon as you turn that off, you're gonna find problems with this device. Now, there are some other components within here though. So I don't wanna turn off that big radio button, but you can see, I have unchecked the include audio recordings. This is audio recordings that Google will use then for manual, um, manual checks. They will actually check that the voice assistant responded correctly and they do that by listening to audio recordings in some cases. So that's maybe one you want to turn off. There was kind of a big deal here on, in, on news sites and in general about the different voice assistants doing that thing. Now, audio recordings, there you have it. I have paused those audio recordings and this is, again, just helping them to improve audio recognition. I'm going to recommend to you that you don't turn that on. I think Google can do their own research to figure those things out. App info from your devices, I'm leaving that on. Pretty much all the rest of these, you have to leave on in a lot of cases. Add personalization, I've left on. Kind of make my money on YouTube, guys. You decide how you want to deal with that. But those settings, if you don't have them all on, in a lot of cases, you'll find problems with your Nest Hub. So privacy, you want to manage it. There's a couple of things you want to change. But in general, you gotta leave most of this available for data in the Google Assistant. Let's talk about adding other devices and services in here because in order to control your lights and your thermostat, you have to add those things in as well as having cameras and smart plugs and all these different great devices that we can go out there and get. Now, you can see right at the top, it's actually saying I can connect my home assistant cloud and this is one of the ways that you can quickly integrate a service. So I've tapped on that and now I've got to put in credentials and that can all come in. We're going to do that, but I'm not going to do it through this method because I want to show you the other basic method that you will use most of the time. But what I wanted to point out was that this little aspect of the application shows you as you install apps on your phone and you get devices connected, you'll often find the ability to connect to that very quickly right there. What we are mostly going to do is hit that plus up at the top and then we're gonna hit the setup device. Now, what we can do here is add a new device like a Chromecast or a Nest speaker by tapping here or we can use the works with Google segment. So I'm going to do a search for one of the services that I wanna connect here and actually I'm gonna type in Twinkly cause I just disconnected their service here and there you go. I just have to tap on that button for Twinkly. Now, what comes up with every one of these services is you have to log in with the credentials you've used over there. So I'm just gonna hit that and sign in. Now you have to have your credentials at the ready for that other service. And when you do that, it's gonna return back to the application here and that service will have been connected. Now, what often happens is, especially if you have multiple devices, it will show up here and then you'll be able to go through a little bit of a process for adding those devices into your home and then into a room. Now, with Twinkly, it just didn't do that, but I can always find those devices down here at the very bottom. So that section is the linked to you section, but you can see that there are 48 devices not in a room. Now that's because I'm me and I just have way too many services, but there's my twinkly light that I just added and I can go in there and I could hit this quick link to add to a room. I can also control the device of course, and I can go into the settings, which then allows me again to add it to a home 
hit the next button and then it will allow me to move the device and choose the room. Now my Twinkly right now happens to be in my kid's bedroom so I select that, I hit next and now that device is in a room and I also have that name on it that I can use to turn it on and off. So anytime I'd like Twinkly to turn on or off I just have to say that and you can see the ability to unlink Twinkly right here. So I could do that through that same add section. I could actually unlink and, and reconnect accounts if I needed to, but that allows me to unlink Twinkly here and get rid of that device in the Google Home application. But let me show you again, way up at the top here, add and manage, then I'm going to set up device and then I'm going to works with Google and see I can go ahead and I can select unlink account and that's how I took Twinkly out and then re-added it back in. So if I hit that unlink, it's gone. If I hit reconnect, that sometimes is helpful if you're having a device not show up for some reason in your Google Home app. That might be something you need to do. Uh, the other way, once you've reconnected an account, if you're not, still not finding a device showing up that maybe you just added in that system, what you say is you request, you give it the wake word, and then you say sync my devices. And it'll take a few seconds to respond and then it'll sync all the devices from all the different providers that you have connected here. So if I said that, it's gonna to connect to a lot of different services and pull those devices in. So that's just a basic now. Anytime I go into my lights, I can turn on and off in the kid's bedroom here. I could turn on and off those lights. I can also go into that bedroom and get even deeper here every time. There's Twinkly and there I've turned it on this way. Plus I can go in and I can make adjustments to some lights on color. The Twinklies are a little different. They have kind of color patterns and things like that. So they're a little different, but in general, you're gonna find the ability to manage your lighting in there. In general, you'll want to go into the different devices and explore the settings. So here's a camera from Wise. I can adjust the name, the home, the room, and there again, I could unlink wise home now the video stream can't be viewed on this one but if i wanted to i could request it here wise cams they're a little bit odd right now with the google assistant but you have that ability for any device type you're going to have different device settings now this is just a sensor here it's actually a door sensor coming over from smart things all i can actually get from that is a request to the Google Assistant here to read the device temperature on that. I can't tell whether the door is open or not just yet. But some of the devices you might wanna have a look at, you know, a great device type to check on is smart plugs because we're gonna plug different devices in there. So what we get is this device type capability. And device types allow us to set what's connected there. So if it's a coffee maker, you can go ahead and select that and then it will do that. Now, the icon can then change on the main screen and that just gives us a better visual for what's going on, plus the visuals change on the smart display as well. Now, the other thing that about that is different device types can be scheduled. So you could say the kitchen outlet you know what, I wanna turn that on in 15 minutes. That's a great command to give or to turn it off after so long. So you have this ability to then schedule these devices a little bit. So uh, a great example is you go into the room and you wanna turn on the coffee pot for the next half an hour just to make sure that it warms up and it gets everything ready for you. So you say, turn on coffee pot for 30 minutes and that device type can be scheduled and this really helps you not to have to remember to turn that coffee pot off after so long and you can only really do that with smart plugs and smart switches as well as a couple other device types. When you have as many services as I do, I showed you that I have so many different services, you end up with duplicates and that's actually a lot of what is down here at the bottom in the linked to you section. Lots of these devices are actually duplicates. Now, 
This becomes a big problem for managing and so maybe you want to disconnect some services. I use aggregator services more often than I do the individual one. So a great example of that is Samsung SmartThings. I bring in the Philips Hue lights into there. I bring in SwitchBot into there, Wemo, I bring a lot in. That creates an extra layer that maybe if SmartThings is down, you can't get to your Wemo switch through Google Home. So you gotta remember that. But in general, I'm using that aggregator function. You could turn off those big aggregators and not have that, but I have so many devices in SmartThings that that makes sense for me. But there's a little trick here that you can do because when you request something to turn on, well, you might, you might hear the Google Assistant come back and say, yeah, okay, I'm turning on two devices, but really it's the same named device in there twice. So you have all these duplicates. So you can go into the device settings. Now, what you can do here is change the name. And yes, what happens here, you're delinking it from the name over in SmartThings. So you can see that this one, this is clearly a duplicate that I have decided not to use and it's from smart things. So this is garage entry one and I could rename this whatever I'd like. And if you put in random characters and then you hit save, you're done. That's not going to turn on two devices anymore. That's all you have to do. What I also sometimes do is move it over to the other home. This can help you to kind of eliminate that from the display and just make things a little bit easier for yourself. One of the major segments of managing your home is here in the settings tab or the settings button. So this is another one of those settings screens different from the Google Assistant settings that we've been in for the most part here. But we have a home information. This is where you can go change the nickname of the home. That's that title at the top of the whole application and you can change the address very quickly. The household is how we can start to invite people in and we're going to talk about managing your family a little more here in a few minutes but that's where you can add in more people plus you have the rooms and groups and you can just break down things get into those different rooms and change some settings on those so which devices are in there you can get in and you can just choose devices so this becomes a nice way to add a bunch of devices in very quickly to one single room. One other aspect of your whole application here is the history tab. Now, history, you can see I unlinked Twinkly right there. That's where I did that process earlier and you can see the history of everything. So here's where some motion was sensed by my camera and you can just see it's actually just turning on a light and this is while I was gone and you can see another tablet I'm actually testing there, but it's just giving me that events history. So as you move throughout your history here, you can see a lot of things. So there's where my home switched to away at three yesterday, and you can go ahead and edit that routine quickly. So this is a quick way to go through and manage these different aspects of what's happening in your home. One of the biggest aspects of the whole system in our routines, and the reason for that is because it can be one voice assistant command you give, or actually there's a couple of triggers you can use to run many steps. So we're gonna walk through routines here. Now, that's a button at the front. There's a number of different ways to get to this. And here are those household routines of home and away that we've dealt with before, where we can just go ahead and have present sensing Put our home in the right state. Now, the other routines, the, there are these play buttons over on the right. So you can start those routines by hitting those. And down here at the bottom is the brand new routine starting interface. So if you want to create a new routine, it was that big plus button there. Now, what we, what we have to do is add a starter every time. And you always have to have a voice command for this routine. And it's it's at least one but you can add more and the reason to add more is so you don't have to remember exactly what it was that you wanted to say to start this routine the other starters that i can add are just time and if you have a voice starter and a time 
well, then it's going to just start at that time. So you can select the time and then you can choose the days that you would like it to repeat. If there's any assistant audio coming out of a device, you can select it. Now you can select none for some of these routines. Sometimes you're told you have to have one. So you can go ahead and set that as, let's say the bedroom display. And do you wanna get notified on your phone? That's an option, again, if you have the Google Assistant. Uh, application that will show up for sure. So this is gonna happen at midnight on Tuesday and Friday, so I'm probably not gonna save this routine in the end, but this routine will, and now we have to choose the actions. Now there's a number of different segments, so getting info, reminders, communication, so if you want to uh, announce certain things, uh, setting the assistant volume on that speaker, right? Adjusting home devices, we just went through all the different aspects there. Plus you can adjust phone settings, and you'll notice back there, like the communicate and announce that was send and read text. Some of these are just within your phone and that will depend on the type of phone you have as to whether those things can happen. And again, that Google Assistant application. The ability to play and control media is very important. This is one that I think you're gonna use in a lot of cases. So music, news, radio, podcasts, audiobooks if you've connected the playbook experience and even sleep sounds and each one of these you can go into and select different things so if you want the sleep sounds to play ocean sounds here you can set that as an action the last one is maybe the most important this is try adding your own and it's custom actions and what's happening here is you can write anything that you would want to say to the google assistant and then it will execute that action. So you saw we were able to play the media there for a second and you know that's great. We can play those sleep sounds and start the ocean sounds. That's great but we couldn't set a time period within that part of the routine but we can here. So if I want to and I'm just gonna tilt up my phone here. If I would like to play ocean sounds I can do that. There, I have that command that is just here. So that's great. This will work and this will play ocean sounds and it will play on the device that we've started the routine on. Let's say we wanted a different device to play out the ocean sounds. We can actually set that in here. So we could say on, and I gotta think I have an office display that I could play that on. Plus, if I want to get even more complicated, let's say I only want to play those ocean sounds for 15 minutes. I now have a very custom command stuck in here to play ocean sounds on the office display for 15 minutes. And that is much more complicated than this simple ability to play and control media. So I find the custom actions very powerful. It allows me to do things like customize any of these sources, what I'm playing exactly. And within any of these other setting sections, you know, the, the phone settings, the home section, any of those devices, all of these things can be customized by that custom action. So these are great actions to use and it's great to have these very easy things to add as actions like the broadcasting I'm home, but this is stuff that I can do with those custom actions. So I like to use that more. One of the other things about the play and control media, let's say I add in play music and all I'm saying is play music. I'm not putting in any of those custom things. It has to be the bottom action. No matter what else I do here, if I want to adjust lights, well, you can see the adjustment of lights went above the play music. So playing any of that content always has to go last unless you're using that custom action. So really powerful there with the custom action. Of course, in this kind of a routine, we would start those ocean sounds and about three seconds later, we would start playing music. So it would get overwritten. So you still gotta think about how you're organizing your routine, but you do have this option to use those custom things. Now, the adjust lights, plugs, and more, this is basically all your home devices. You can change them, you can turn them on or off. And 
you know, if you have lighting that you want to set to a custom percentage, that's something that you can do. So you can request uh, to turn the lights on through the custom action here. We can go ahead and say set bedroom lights to 50%. Or we could say something like set the bedroom lights to green and that would change all the ones that are color capable to green. So those customized actions again really help even within the home control segment. Now I could save this if I had a voice starter in there and I can also edit the routine. So it's really important to note that you can adjust and delete different aspects of your routine. So this becomes a great way to kind of edit those routines. And of course, we can go into any of our older routines and make those same adjustments. Now, one of the really great features here within a routine that you have already saved is this shortcut button up at the top that I can add it to the home screen and then it becomes something on the dis on the desktop of my phone or on the display of my phone that I can tap on to start that routine as well. Before we go on from the home control section, let me show you a number of the different commands that you can use with your home, your smart home devices. And there are a ton here, I can't cover everything, so I'm just gonna show you a couple of commands, but this really just becomes a very easy thing to do as you add in more devices. The easiest control method in a lot of cases when you're around your device is actually to go to the home control tab. And we've already walked through all of these different things, but I will give you some of the basic controls here. Now, my bedroom lights, if I tap on them, they will automatically turn on. And why it's the bedroom lights here is because I've put this display in the Google Home app in the bedroom room and then I've also put those lights in the bedroom room and that means that I can quickly turn them on and off here through the application. Plus I can go another layer deeper and I can make adjustments here. I can turn them on and off here. I can change color on the ones that have the different color changing abilities and I can go into the different lights and adjust them individually if I would like. Plus, I can go another layer deeper if I want to adjust the bedside lamp. I can do that here. So we have a full control interface, but let's make some adjustments on some of these lights as we go. One of the first commands you can give is to turn on an individual light or turn it off. Now, I have the bedroom bulb on in my bedroom at the moment and I can go ahead and adjust that. So, turn off bedroom bulb. So you can see it brought up that interface. If I wanted to make further adjustments, I could. The other thing that we can do is to turn off all lights in any room. Now, because this is in the bedroom, I can actually just say, turn off the lights. Turn off lights. So what it's done there is it's turned off all of the bedroom lights all at once, and I didn't even have to say bedroom lights. Now, if I want to adjust in the different rooms, I will have to say that. So because the bedroom display is in the bedroom in the app, it's adjusting all of those lights. But if I wanna turn off the bathroom lights, well then I need to say turn off bathroom lights. One other important control for your lights and your smart plugs and things like that is to set the timeline that you'd like them to go for. So turn on bedroom lights for three minutes. I'll turn on six lights for three minutes. The other thing you might want to do is turn on all of your lights or turn on off all of your lights. You can do that. Keep in mind that that is all lights and you want to watch out with turning all or everything off because you will actually turn off things like your thermostat. Now, if you're not really afraid of turning off everything in a certain room, well, 
then you have the ability to actually use that as a command. So if I go to my studio, which is what we're in right now, I have the ability to turn off everything in the studio. So right now it only shows the four lights, but I've had these set, these smart plugs set as just plugs before. So if I say, turn off everything in the studio. All right. So you can see how that quickly turned off everything in a specific room. That's not as dangerous as long as you kind of know where things like your thermostat are. Our other option is to do a couple of actions at the same time and you have to kind of structure this the right way. So you have to almost say the whole command at the same time or completely even if you're saying and do something else. So let's try and do this. Turn on everything in the bedroom and turn off everything in the studio. Okay, turning on nine things. Sorry, it looks like the bedroom cast isn't available right now. Sure, turning off four things. You can see when you make a command like that, it takes a long time to process the actual command up in the top left. But once it does start executing, it executes them all pretty much at the same time. The next thing that you might want to do is to execute some of those routines. And sure, I can do it in the app here or on the display, but I can also just use the commands that I see here in order to execute any of those. So I'm going to say bedtime. Bedtime. The device is now executing all the different components of that bedtime routine. There might be things that show up on the display here. I don't actually remember everything that goes on. There you go. So it's starting rain sounds and that is something that I generally enjoy at night. Of course, if you have a smart thermostat in your home, you're going to be able to give commands like turn down the thermostat, turn up the thermostat, or change it to a specific temperature. So you can see here we have additional controls and if I'd like, I can make adjustments to the thermostats. Now for something like a smart TV here, I can go into that control and if I ever request anything to do with the bedroom Roku here, um, which is a Roku TV, if I ever request it, this interface shows up and then I have all those different controls. But I can also request to turn on that TV. So, turn on TV. What's important to note there is because I just said turn on TV, it went to the one that's in the same room. So you kind of have these shortcuts where you don't have to say the name of the device if you know the type of it and you know that it's in the same room as your Google Nest Hub. One of the other big features are smart cameras and this is a really important aspect that you can request all your different cameras to play or to show and that's kind of the thing that you want to use. Now I have a number of wise products here. They don't necessarily show up very well on the Nest Hub so I don't recommend those anymore. We kind of expected that they would start to work but Wise and Google have never been able to get it together here. So instead what you want to do is say something like show Nest camera. If I'd like I can double tap in order to zoom in on a spot within the camera's view here, but that's really all of the controls that we're being given at the moment with these Nest cameras. All right, now we've done everything in this application except talk about other people. And this is one of the more complicated aspects of Google Home and the Google Nest Hub in general, but we can start very simply by inviting other people to our home. One of the easiest ways to do that is through the settings button right here. You can go into household and you can invite a person. Now, 
This is names or email accounts that you have in your list. So I'm going to go ahead and add in another account of mine that will allow me to give that person full access and control to the home. So I'm hitting next just a bunch of times because it's telling me all of that. And it looks like I could adjust which devices they have access to, but not yet in the Google Home application. So we're just gonna hit this invite and they will get an email. Or you can see I've got a notification on my phone because it's a Google phone and I just invited a Google account. So I have everything now. It's also telling me right away that I can add the person I invited to my family group. And we wanna do that in general right off the bat. It becomes much easier to manage. Although you can do that through the you section and your people section. You can add people to your family member there, which I showed earlier in the video. If you need that, go earlier in the video here, use the time codes below. But I just added that person to my household and to my family. They become a household contact. A whole bunch of things just happened for them. What I would say you should do in general, there's a email that you can tap on and it'll bring you back to the app. But if you get that person logged in to their own phone on the Google Home application, what they will see is this pending invitation. And I can go ahead and hit the next button plus more and agree to all the same kind of privacy things and et cetera, et cetera here. So it's allowing me to get this person integrated into the home by just accepting the invitation. It's allowed me to enter in a home nickname for myself here as this second individual, and it's going to allow me to set up voice match. Now that's something you probably wanna do with the other people living in your home. You wanna go through this process, and this is really back to that very basic setup process earlier on. So it's going to ask me to create a voice, voice profile. Obviously, uh, I'm already me and I've already created a voice profile. So I don't really want to create a second one here. So this person, again, has to choose a default music service. They are going to need to have a family account alongside you or have to be added to that family account. That's something you have to manage in whatever service you're using. YouTube Music is very easy to create that family account, invite those different people again. They would have to link those radio services and the video services. So, you know, you have those different profiles on Netflix and Disney and you have to add them in here again and then connect to their specific profile. They're getting the same opportunities to everything that you are, including emails and notifications and things like that. And now we're just at the end where we can join the family finally. It feels like I've well, I've created a new family, people. Because I named it Brian 2 Home, my initial home here doesn't have anything really in it. And as this new user, they'll just stay on this other home and they'll have a couple of there, a couple of them there. And they have the ability to set up the home and away routines and add their phone as a presence sensor here. So you'll probably want to take their phone for a little bit here and go through and make sure that things are generally looking right. But at this point, they are voice matched and they can start to get a lot of those other things that you set up like the calendars and reminders and they can start to use all those aspects plus they have the ability to control the whole home from their smartphone. They also have different things like duo profiles, all of those things that we've talked about earlier in the video, you're gonna wanna go back through and set up different components as they want them. If you're like me, a little while ago, you might have had a kid and it doesn't work in the same way to add that kid to the Google Assistant. You actually need a separate application. That application is called Family Link and that's the way that you invite them to the home. So if you try and add them through the invite home member or that other link that I used earlier here in this segment, 
unfortunately that's not going to work for you so what you have to do is get to the family link application or families.google.com and that's how you go through the invitation process to add children now it's a bit of a different process that you go through there's a number of privacy settings that you're going to want to walk through but it's really great to have that family link application in order to connect them to the Google Assistant. Within the family link application, there's actually this family group here. And so that's what you go into. And this is how you can invite family members. You can see you can have up to six, so you might have a limit there. And then you can supervise a family member. So does your child have a Google account? They will actually walk you through the process of even setting up a Google account for your child and then getting them connected into Family Link. Now, once they're in Family Link, you can see my child has his own uh, profile here and we can manage all of the different settings for them including screen time what they're connected into what devices they have access to now the manage of the managing of settings the one that you're going to care the most about is Google Assistant now do we want to allow my kid the ability to do third-party actions well, that's up to you. Um, you know, if you've done the filters already on the device, then those third party actions are kind of already down to the family friendly ones. You can add your kid to specific devices. Now this allows them to get those personal results on any of those devices and you can create a voice match recording for your child. So this is where you can do those things. You can't really do them over in the Google Home application as of now. You need this Family Link application as well. There's also all of these other filters and settings for YouTube that you may care about as a parent. This is going to more affect things like what they what they have access to on tablets but these are important things for just managing from an overall perspective now that we have all of these things set up there's a number of features that we can use we can use the broadcast feature to broadcast to our whole family that's great or broadcast to a specific device we can actually use the smart display interface as well to call a specific device the other great new feature is the family notes feature and yes we can assign reminders to people but I think family notes on these smart displays especially if they're in a public space I think those are every bit as good so you're able to use all of these things in conjunction with your family and you can actually with the assignable reminders section is choose who within your family can send you reminders. You'll only get that option once they've created that first reminder for you but that is where you can set those people who can assign you reminders. You don't want to let your kid assign you reminders do you? Simply put, this effort was massive and there's no other way to say that. Even just filming all of this today took me almost six hours to complete, I think, by the time, yeah, everything was said and done. So if you really enjoy this kind of content, you need this in your smart home. Please consider supporting us over on Patreon or just con consider sharing this. That's a really big way to help us out here on Automate Your Life. Otherwise, thanks for watching today. I hope you have everything working with your Nest Hub. And of course, don't hate, automate.